hearing and take you back live to the House hearing with executives from General Motors and Chrysler and a number of auto dealers on the impact of the bankruptcies. Bart Stupak chairing the uh, Subcommittee of Commerce just resuming their hearing live here on C-SPAN 2. Am I on now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, distinguished members of this subcommittee, I want to thank you for the honor of appearing here today. I would especially like to thank, thank Cong Congresswoman Sutton for her role in providing this opportunity to represent my fellow dealers. We are losing seven dealerships because Chrysler, the Bankruptcy Court, and the executive branch of our government have acted precipitously to deny us our economic rights. This is a public policy issue worthy of your time and worthy of congressional legislation since without your prompt intervention to restore our rights to franchisees under state law, 2,000 small businesses and approximately 100,000 jobs will be lost. As a nation, can we really afford to let this take place? I urge Congress to enact H.R. 2743, the Bipartisan Automobile Dealer Economic Rights Restoration Act, next week. We have a long and proud history with Chrysler and GM. The majority of our stores sell these brands and these brands only. None of our stores are dual with other brands. We have a combined 374 years of business relations with Chrysler alone. We are passionate about both Chrysler and GM and we want both comp companies to succeed. We are committed to helping them do so. That is why we are both disappointed and perplexed by their recent actions to terminate us and over 2,000 other dealers. We're not perfect. During those 374 years of operations, we've made mistakes. Like Chrysler's managers, our managers aren't perfect either. Nevertheless, we have stood shoulder to shoulder with Chrysler during good times and bad. In fact, my uncle Dell, as the president of the Dodge National Dealer Council, lobbied this very Congress for funds to bail out Chrysler the first time. We never quit on them. And they shouldn't quit on us and the hundreds of other dealers who are, remain committed to Chrysler. This issue is not about the Spitzer family or our seven dealerships that are being terminated or even the 300 plus employees who work in them. It is about destroying the entire net worth and life's work of hundreds of entrepreneurs and the thousands of people they employ. And I fear that these actions by Chrysler and GM will lead to their demise. And all of it is unnecessary. First, our dealerships do not cost manufacturers one dime. All products and services which Chrysler and GM provide are charged back to the dealership at a profit. Whether it's special tools, training, or even those colorful, colorful brochures, we pay for all of it. We build our own facilities, we provide our own operating capital, we hire our own people, and if we lose money, it comes out of our pocket. Second, Chrysler has argued that the 789 dealerships terminated were for performance reasons or to put all brands under one roof. As demonstrated by, by the sworn testimony of myself and dozens of other dealers in the bankruptcy court, many of the terminated dealerships were high performing or Genesis stores or both. Chrysler did not terminate dealers for reasons, but rather to rid themselves of outspoken dealers and will now redistribute to other dealers <laughs> while skirting around the laws of all 50 states, laws which pr otherwise pr prohibit this type of arbitrary and capricious action. Profitable, high-performing dealerships will be given to our fellow remaining dealers with no due process and no compensation whatsoever. It is unconscionable for a failed private business to bankrupt another private business which was succeeding, but when our government uses its power, its influence, and our money to aid and abet such action, it is downright un-American. At a time when our government is spending billions of dollars to stimulate the economy and create new jobs, this action will destroy 37,000 jobs with Chrysler dealers and quite likely another 60,000 or more at GM dealerships and millions and millions of local tax dollars will be lost and all for no good reason. 
In fact, this plan may ultimately destroy the new Chrysler and, se and severely damage GM's hopes of survival. Dealers are their only customers. We are the face of these once proud car companies in our communities. The fact that we have survived and prospered over the last hundred years, even as they often produce vehicles American consumers did not want, proves that independent entrepreneurs find ways to survive and create employment opportunities even in tough times. If Congress does not step in, dealers will be unwilling to invest in new facilities, purchase millions of dollars in inventory, and otherwise risk their capital if state law protections are meaningless and if it can all be taken away in the next downturn. Fewer dealers today means fewer sales of Chrysler and GM products tomorrow, leading to a further erosion of market share for both companies. Allow the marketplace to select who lives and who dies, not some committee in Detroit. As of today, approximately 350 of the 789 rejected dealers have accepted their fate by, by objecting, Gesundheit, by objecting, not objecting to their terminations. Thus, the accelerated reduction of dealerships has already occurred for those who believe such a reduction was necessary. There is no need to eliminate those of us who remain committed to Chrysler and GM success. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I can assure you that I will work tires tirelessly and will not rest until H.R. 2743 becomes law, which already has over 100 co-sponsors, uh, Congressman Maffey, Congresswoman Sutton, Congressman ha Hoyer, and Van, and, and Van Holland and others who have supported our bill, and we've only been out three days. So thank you for your, your time, and I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spetzer. You want to hand that mic to Mr. Golick, and we'll hear from Mr. Golick. Distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I am one of the 789 dealers at Chrysler's Terminating. I'm here to give you my views on the situation and to advise you on what you can do to help us. My dealership is located in the suburb of Pittsburgh. We've been there since 1935 and been in our present building since 1948. And we're a family-run dealership. I'm the third generation to sell new vehicles at our facility. One of the distinguished members of your subcommittee, Congressman Doyle, has bought three new vehicles from us and sent some of his friends and family to our store so he knows firsthand what we're all about and how we run our business. My family and my employees have worked very hard to maintain our excellent reputation. The Golic name has been synonymous with trust and integrity. I want to tell you next about the pressure that Chrysler placed on me several years ago to purchase the Chrysler franchise from a neighboring dealer. They pushed me into paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy that franchise and told me that my facility was fine and that I could stay in my present location indefinitely. Now that my franchise has been stripped from me, I have been deprived of recovering that money as I could have sold my franchises locally for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Last week, there was a Senate hearing on June 3rd, and the president of Chrysler, Jim Press, said these words, and I quote, that Chrysler wants to bring the performers along that will allow us the best return on our investment. In the case of the dealers not being taken forward last year, we lost 55,000 units of sales, unquote. I'd like to let everyone know that I'm one of their performers. I've always been at 150% of my required minimum sales responsibility and 150% of my required working capital. My customer satisfaction rating has been among the highest in the state of Pennsylvania for many years, and I've always been profitable. Now I'd like to talk about why us dealers do not cost the factory any money or very little money. In the case of my dealership, the total cost of the factory, I really believe, would be about $2,000 per year. To arrive at that number, I'm guessing my district manager's annual salary say 52000 and I divide that by the 26 dealers in my district, and thus I come up with the 2000 per dealer cost. Last week at the Senate hearing, Jim Press said that each dealer cost the factory about $41,000 per year, which is a far cry from the 2000 that I'm coming up with. He gave his side of the story as to why Chrysler needed to eliminate 789 dealers. Mr. Press said that the dealers should have sold 55,000 more units than they did last year, and that and that cost the factory $1.5 billion in lost revenue. What he didn't say is that when we're gone, they'll lose 140,000 units in annual sales, and the factory's going to lose $4 billion annually. So let's see, you're worried about the 55,000 units, but you're going to lose 140,000 units. No wonder you're in trouble. I mean, with that kind of thinking, I, don't, I, I just don't see the logic. Second, he said us dealers cost the factory $1.4 billion a year in development costs. 
that's a very large sum of money. I would really like to see the breakdown of those numbers and how the 789 dealers cost you that much. I mean, you you went into this theory about how you have to have two separate minivans, the, the Chrysler and the Dodge, and that costs you money to build an extra minivan. You put a different hubcaps, different wheels on the car, different grill, and different seat fabrics. I don't see the real cost, heavy cost involved with that. I really don't. Next, I'd like to talk about the process of selecting the 789 dealers. In Chrysler's viability report that they submitted to the government in February, Chrysler indicated that 25% of their dealers were in financial trouble. I'm not in financial trouble. I'd like to know how many of those dealers that were in financial trouble are still with the company. If Chrysler was bent on eliminating 25% of their dealer body, the prudent thing to do would be get rid of the 25% that were in financial trouble and represented a liability to them. My guess is that many of the tr financially troubled dealers were picked to continue with the new Chrysler. I'd now like to talk about the rationale of cutting any dealers at all in this tough economy. Ford Motor Company's not cutting any of its dealers, and they're doing pretty good right now. In the 70s, when Chrysler was in financial trouble and the government stepped in, how many dealers did Lee Iacocca cut? He didn't cut any. One would never think that we would see the day when someone could just take your business from you in the United States of America. But this very day is now upon us. Why can't we let the free market decide which dealers survive or fail? Why dictate it under the cloak of bankruptcy? That was un-American. No matter what the outcome here, I really think that the bankruptcy laws should be changed to protect executory contracts such as new car franchise agreements, as I believe they represent a pure revenue stream to the factory, and we must protect the dealers' rights and protect the manufacturers from their own imprudence. I'd also like to say that at least the GM dealers that were being eliminated were given some money. You know, they were given 10 months to wind down, and GM offered each dealer anywhere from $100,000 to $1 million to help with the transition. The Chrysler dealer's soft landing, quote, was three weeks long, and we received absolutely no compensation, nothing, not one penny. That was an unconscionable act. In closing, I'd like to give some, some facts and figures that should point the way forward from here. I took a look back at the past eight years of Chrysler's financial statements, and I've discovered that they did not have a year where they made more than $2 billion profit in any one year. In fact, they lost money in five of the last eight years. The point I'm trying to make here is that I really want the new Chrysler to succeed. They will need every order and every sale from us dealers that they can get in the next couple of years to survive. They have exited bankruptcy owing over $13 billion to the Treasury. The past shows that it's very difficult to even make $2 billion profit in any one year as an auto manufacturer. The, the pragmatic approach to getting that money paid back to the Treasury is to reinstate us dealers and let us order our 140,000 vehicles annually. This will give Chrysler $4 billion in annual revenue to help them survive and pay back that money. I am extending an offer to Sergio Marchionne from Fiat to welcome us with open arms. And I am urging Congress to sign on to Bill H.R. 2743, which will restore our rights and our protection under the state franchise laws to where they were before Chrysler entered bankruptcy. If Chrysler wants to pare back their dealer body, why not let them do it within the framework of the state franchise laws, which were enacted to prevent this very thing from happening? Again, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to hear me out. May God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Golick, and thank you to everyone for your testimony. We're going to go to questions, five minutes each. I'm going to hold the line on to five minutes, and we'll probably go more than one round. Let me ask Mr. Press and Mr. Henderson this. The committee staff has received reports that some dealerships have, that have been chosen to go forward, in other words, not being closed, are being told that they should resign from positions of the National Auto Dealers Association, NADA, and from positions on state auto dealer associations because of NADA's support of legislation to reinstate state franchise agreements, that's the Mahaffey Bill, H.R. 2743. So are either you, Mr. Henderson or Mr. Press, aware of any such calls being made on behalf of GM or Chrysler or to tell people not to be on these boards and state boards? Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of any of those calls. I'm not only not aware of them, if I, anybody in my company is doing that, I would like to reprimand them or perhaps let them go. Okay. Well, will you commit, Mr. Press and Mr. Henderson, will you commit to sending out a letter, a correspondence, a message to the employees of your companies instructing them that such intimidation would not be tolerated? Uh, we, we had an all 
uh, field conference call uh, with all of our field organization prior to starting this, and that was exactly uh, the instructions that was given to them to uh, to make sure that this was done in a very uh, positive manner. Right. My, my question, though, would you put that in writing and send it to everybody? Uh, Absolutely. There's no. Uh, I would like to know if anybody in our company did that. I would like, if you have that information, right I would like to have that. Here's an email from one of them right here. Okay. Okay. Can't, can't do that. If you if you got if you have a, such an email, why don't you give the one to members here? They can ask the question more specifically than on that. It says that they should be there. Mr. Henderson. Mr. Chairman, I'll put that in writing. Okay. So I take Mr. Press and Mr. Henderson. You'll put it in writing then for us. Okay. Thanks. Let me ask this, Mr. Henderson. It's my understanding. When you testified last week at the Senate, there was no appeal process for the um, closed franchise, for closed dealers. And then at the Senate, you, you announced the uh, an appeal process, and and you said you re done a re review, and 45 dealers have those decisions been reversed. So w you didn't have an appeal process in, until you testified before the Senate, right? No, sir. We had planned to have an appeal process. Oh, you planned, but you didn't have one. I mean, those dealers who are closed. When they were given their notice, they're closing. They did not receive uh, a way to appeal. You announced it that Wednesday and then Thursday, uh, the process was made, emailed to everybody, and they had till Monday to submit their documents on appealing. Right? Yes, they needed to submit their documents, sir. Okay. Does Chrysler have any appeal process for any of the dealers that were closed? No, sir. Okay. So, it's, if, if I may, Mr. Preston, then the. Dealers you closed, there could have been some mistakes made then. The, this, our, our situation, I think, is different from General Motors, uh, and therefore uh, the conditions uh, are not really, uh, would, be, would be favorable for uh, having an appeal process. Uh, because of the short time frame? Uh, no, not, not the short time frame. The, the reason is that the, in General Motors, I, I believe, and I'm not totally aware, I think they have a, ter a term agreement which is not being renewed and there's a process to go through for non-renewal. Uh, our situation is, is quite different from a standpoint that the, our, our company went bankrupt, a new company was formed Correct. to take a, a different dealer body forward, and strategically that dealer body that was taken forward was based on criteria not performance oriented but strategic performance uh, criteria with regard to uh, single uh, single line versus tri branding, but and many other aspects that yeah. that really, uh, for example, uh, locations or even the uh, the population and demographic uh, projections. But but the single line and, and tri vehicle that's not the dealer's fault, that's Chrysler's fault. I mean, if you got too many vans that are the same thing, other than the elite uh, seats, the grill and, and the design. That's not their fault. That, that, that's really Chrysler's fault. So why are they being punished? Great question, sir. I understand why you'd ask that, and I understand the passion. Uh, I mean, I, I drive an Oldsmobile. They did away with it. I drove an Oldsmobile all my life. Yes. My last one here, I'm nursing along. I got pretty close to 200000 on it, <laughs> and I don't want to leave it. But at least I got other options, but I'm mad that they closed Oldsmobile. Yes, sir. But, but I understand the double branding. So, so why, why couldn't that's... In, in coming to, I've been the company a short time. I came from Toyota for 37 years, and, okay. I, and I think that everybody understands the difficulties that uh, our company has had with regard to integrity of product, quality, and, uh, and appeal. Uh, in asking why that is, it, it isn't because people don't want to build good cars and trucks. There are insufficient resources available to do the engineering and development necessary to build winning formula vehicles. In, in our case, uh, it isn't just. Uh, wheel covers and grills, it's about 250 to 300 million dollars per sister vehicle. Sure. Uh, and that investment doesn't return any incremental sales and it requires that we advertise the two cars against each other and it's one of the most important reasons why the company went bankrupt is that we were, we kept kicking this problem down the road instead of addressing it, which is what we did. Okay, my, my time's up and I'm sure others, but, but, but that's a, that's your decision. The dealers, even the dealers who survived, it's not their problem that we have a sister vehicle, as you call it. That's really Chrysler's problem, and the new Chrysler has got to address it. So drop one like, like you did on my Oldsmobile. Drop, drop one. We did, sir. and that's Save the, that money. We did, and that's 555 of the dealers that are discontinued were selling not three brands but one, and that was a necessary part of this. It, it, it wasn't our desire. Uh, it wasn't a plan. But 555 of these dealers that had only one brand won't have viable products coming and unless all three brands are under one roof, the dealer body isn't, isn't going to be viable. Yeah, my time's up, but the retort would be, why not 
allow those one brand dealers sell all three of your vehicles and keep them open? Be well, because the, our volume has gone from over two million a year to seven hundred thousand. And the only way our dealers will ever survive, and I think these dealers all really understand that, is to have all three brands under one roof where they can put together the synergy, the total customer base, and the fixed costs will be covered. And that's something that everybody wants. We've known that for 10 years. Then let them do it. Mr. Walden, for questions. Thank, I'm sorry. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Henderson, a uh, question for you. Who is the purchaser of GM? Uh, the purchasers of General Motors, sir, will be 60.8 percent the United States government, 11.7 percent the Canadian government, 17.5 uh, percent the, uh, of the shares would be held by a VIVA right. trust, and then the remaining approximately 10 percent would be hold, held by the unsecured claimants of General Motors. And so the vehicle acquisition holdings is, is really dominated by the U.S. Treasury, 60.8 they, they will be the They will be the primary shareholder. So in your in your filing on the bankruptcy court, when you say on, on page 40 here, because there are now far more dealerships than the, than the company's market share can support, including in some cases multiple dealers in a single contracting community and dealerships that have become poorly situated as a result of changing demographics, the purchaser is not willing to continue all dealerships. That purchaser, you've told me now, is the U.S. Treasury. Uh, yes, the purchaser. Uh, is the, the largest shareholder is the U.S. Treasury. And it, it goes on to say here in your, in your comments to the court, among the dealerships the purchaser is not willing to continue, for example, are those approximately 400 dealers who sell fewer than 50 cars per year and those approximately 250 dealers who sell fewer than 100 cars per year. Approximately 630 other dealerships are not being continued because they are dealers who in whole or substantial part sell brands that are being discontinued. Correct. So the question I have, we've been trying to get to the bottom of who is dictating how many dealerships are allowed to go forward for General Motors. You've told me here under oath that it's the purchaser, I mean that's what you testified in the bankruptcy court, that it was the purchaser who made that decision and that purchaser is the U.S. Treasury. So doesn't that lead us back to the auto task force? making the decision that you're now having to implement? So the uh, Automotive Task Force, uh, as we've gone through this process, has asked us to go through the process of right-sizing our dealer body. They said that if they're going to buy the company, they want to have a right-sized dealer body. So, the so they asked the management to develop a strategy to accomplish a world-class, correctly-sized dealer body. They were not willing to take on our dealer body as it stood, sir. But, uh, okay, but I, I thought I've read that they, as some of you have said, they didn't have anything to do with setting the dealer levels. They did not tell us a number. Uh, but yet in your, in your testimony of the bankruptcy court, you say, for example, are those approximately 400 dealers who sell fewer than 50 cars per year and those approximately 250 dealers who sell fewer than 100 cars per year? That's true, yes. These are ones that the purchaser is not willing to continue. Amongst others. So the purchaser did tell you they're not willing to continue those dealerships. The purchaser asked us to develop a strategy to have a competitive world-class dealer body. One of the issues that we had were the approximately 400 dealers who sold less than 50 cars per year at, in terms of uh, not being in our so you're, world class. You're telling me the task force didn't tell you that these dealerships that sell fewer than 50 cars per year had to go. What I'm saying, sir, is that the task force d advised us to develop a strategy to have a world-class dealer body properly sized and address uh, what they considered to be serious concerns, which they articulated, for example, in their March 30th findings uh, on, our, on our viability plan. On, on page five of your testimony, you said, and I quote, we have not terminated any dealers. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that? Yes. Let me explain. Can I explain? Yes, please. What we've done is we've offered uh, We've offered dealers who will not continue with us wind down agreements. Right. Uh, the intent of those wind down agreements is to provide a period of time with which to wind down their facility, provide compensation to them, allow them to purchase parts, perform warranty service, and over time, uh, they would no longer, we wouldn't renew their contract and they would no longer be with us. Okay, and beginning this fall, they can't buy the 2010 model year cars from you, can they? They will not be able to purchase new vehicles, that's correct, sir. So it, it sounds to me more like you've diagnose them as with terminal cancer, just not going to take them out until they're... Mr. Thomas, do you feel terminated? Very much so. You want to turn on your microphone there, bring it up close? 
I feel terminated. Why do you feel terminated? Well, because I don't have an opportunity to be a full-fledged General Motors dealer anymore. I can't order new cars. I can't return parts. Uh, I'm, I'm partially in the game, but I'm not really in the game. How about the gentleman next to you? Question. Mr. Bank and Blackheart, do you feel terminated? Absolutely. Why? Same reasons that Mr. Thomas said. Uh, marketplace where I do business has viewed us as going out of business. The press has been to our dealership. The TV stations have been to our dealership. My employees are uh, extremely worried and extremely nervous. Uh, it's just like gut Should there have here. been a different That's way? Human death. I think you, you mentioned that you've had sort of standing offers from people to buy your dealership over the years. I, uh, uh, had, there have been people approach me. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Thomas has had people approach I me. Mean, anybody has a good, viable business. Uh, people could there have been a different strategy here where if you weren't meeting the goals that General Motors set for you, you could have been given time to sell your dealership? Or did they give you an opportunity to change up what it was? That no, sir. And, and when they've evaluated you in the past, did they ever say, look, if you don't do these seven things, next next reauthorization, we're not going to be there for you? No, sir, they didn't. And uh, outside of bankruptcy, they couldn't say that. That's why they wouldn't. All right. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Mr. Dingo, for questions, please. It's a very difficult business here. We have to decide how we're going to protect the rights of the dealers and at the same time see to it that we restructure our American automobile industry so that we save the rest of the dealers, as many of the workers as we can, the jobs and the communities that are affected. That will be why my questions today. First of all, to Mr. Press and Mr. Hendricks, uh, do you have written rules for the closure of dealers and for the termination of the dealers? A yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hendricks? Yes, sir. Would you please submit each of them to the committee with such accompanying remarks as you'd like to make? Um, now, uh, there is no appeal right for a dealer in the case of Chrysler. Is that correct? That's correct. There is, are, do, are, there deal, are there appeal rights for General Motors? Uh, yes, there are, sir. Uh, would you s submit to the committee uh, the, the precise character of those appeal rights? Now, um, would you tell us, please, uh, Mr. Hendricks and Mr. Press, just give us the number, how many of the dealer terminations has, uh, have been changed by the company under the companies under your appellate procedures or under your, your categories and, and standards? Uh, at this point, we've, we've changed 45 decisions. We're not completed with our reviews, but that's the status as of this morning, sir. Mr. Press? Uh, we, we have had no change. All right. I've heard of a dealer uh, who was terminated. I won't tell you which company it was, um, where a big storm had caused the collapse of a bridge. And that dealer was essentially shut off from access to his customers. And he was terminated, but the company involved has uh, seen fit to reinstate the dealer because they understand the facts. Um, do you have provisions in your termination agreement that uh, uh, Mr. Hend Henderson and, and uh, Mr. Press that would permit you to address that kind of a problem? Uh, yes, sir. That was a, a General Motors dealer. Uh, and when we re-looked at the facts after the submission, we concluded that we were in error in our decision and we reversed that decision. Now, Mr. McElhinney, um, if the legislation that we are working on uh, passes and if it screws up the bankruptcy process and causes the collapse of either or both of the companies down the road, we're going to have a rather nasty situation on our hands. Part of it is going to be that we're going to see all the dealers out of business, all the plants close, all the communities hurt, all the workers and all the suppliers hurt. Uh, what do we do about that situation? 
Sir, I think that <clears throat> with that situation, you know, this is not a normal bankruptcy. This is, a, as you well know, a government negotiated bankruptcy. The, uh, the debtor in possession financing is coming I, from I, the federal I government. I understand those things, but what are we going to do if, if that result is occasioned by the situation I, we confront? I don't think that, I don't think that will happen. I, I think that the fact that the government is involved in this, they are going to prevent that from happening. Is that a Pressure's statement or a hope? Across. Pardon me? Is that a statement or a hope that it is not going to happen? I guess that's a hope. Huh? Urban hope. I, sh I join you in that hope. Thank you. Um, Mr. Press, I, uh, Mr. McElhaney, McElhaney asserts this. None of Chrysler's submissions to the government prior to May 14 announcement could have been interpret interpreted to put Chrysler dealers on notice of the scope of the terminations followed. Is that statement true? Yes or no? I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. Uh... His, Mr. McElhaney states as follows. None of Chrysler's submissions to the government prior to the May 14 announcement could have been interpreted to put Chrysler dealers on notice of the scope of the terminations that followed. Yes or no? Is that true? Uh, we, we've had a Genesis program, a dealer consolidation program in place for more than 10 years, and I think the majority of those dealers had a good uh, long time to prepare for that. Would you submit, uh, for the record, your, your, your comments that uh, prove that this is not the case. Now, Mr. McElhaney, uh, did General Motors give adequate warning prior to its May 15 announcement that it would be winding down approximately 1,200 dealers, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mr. Press, please describe briefly what Chrysler is doing to reclaim and redistribute the inventory of the 789 dealerships it announced would be closed. Uh, Mr. Dinklage, just one second. I, I now think I understand your question about notification to the dealers versus knowing that there was a, a reason that they may not stay yes. in business. The notification of the dealers, there, there was not any additional time given. Uh, the primary reason for that was until April 30th at 6 o'clock at night, before we had to file for bankruptcy, we did not plan to. This was not a plan to go forward. We had no knowledge of this. And after that, May 1st is when we began to develop this program. So there was no not notification. All right. Now, Mr. Press, if you please, what is Chrysler doing to reclaim and redistribute the inventory from the 789 dealerships it has announced will be closed? Well, we have uh, committed that we would redistribute every single vehicle and every part uh, and how about specialized equipment? And specialized equipment. And I'm, I'm happy to say that 100% of the vehicles have already been committed to. They've started moving. We're at 80% on the parts and about the same on specialized equipment. We will continue to work uh, until that commitment is fulfilled and all of those uh, burdens are relieved. Now, I want you to listen to this question carefully. How much is it going to cost each dealer on, that is being terminated on each car? from the termination. Uh, are there any fees as associated with that? Do they get the full value of the car? Is it a distressed price? How, how will that be addressed? Uh, the, the, the price is the, the invoice price that they, uh, that they paid less $350 for inspection, cleaning, and transportation to the dealer that will be selling the vehicle. Um, uh, uh, can General Motors give me the same answer, Mr. Hendricks? Sir, in the case of General Motors, to the extent the dealer signs a wind-down agreement, we would, we would expect them over the course of the next 17 months to sell down their inventory, uh, and they would be afforded the same treatment as any other General Motors dealer with respect to retail incentives and support for selling to customers. With how, respect much cash, how much cash money are they going to be out in, in the case of General Motors? They shouldn't be out any. They're going to take back inventory. In the event... Uh, 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 parts, vehicles, and, uh, and specialized equipment. The, uh, in the case of General Motors, if a dealer chooses to wind down, we anticipate that through that period they would not only sell their cars, they would sell their parts by, by virtue of the fact they would be able to provide warranty and service to customers, and then finally the tools would be amortized. With respect to a dealer who terminates, uh, if they just choose to voluntarily terminate, uh, by, by virtue of our agreement with GMAC, a dealer can return the cars to GMAC and we re redistribute the cars with no cost to the dealer. Thank you. My time has expired. I'm sorry. Oh, sir. Hey, Mr. Dingo. Mr. Press, uh, and Mr. Dingo's question is three, $350 uh, for 2009 model, but if they're turning back a uh, 08 model, it's $1,500. There's it? a, a curtailment for the model year is, include, is, is $1,500. Yes, sir. Why do they have to pay you to take back the vehicles when you shut them down? Uh, 
I'm sorry, why do they? Why, why do they have to pay you 350 or $1,500 when you shut them down? Why, why well, do they have we, to pay you to take back their vehicles? Uh, well, first of all, obviously, uh, the, co the company uh, filed bankruptcy. It's right. a defunct organization. And uh, the fact of the matter is, in a bankruptcy, uh, there is uh, all precedent would be that the inventory would be the responsibility of the, the dealer uh, if the company that they're franchised with is, is no longer in business. Uh, there, w there was not a provision in debtor in, in possession financing. It couldn't be uh, provided uh, to buy the cars back. And so our challenge was, and it was a good one, without using taxpayer money, find a way to relieve the dealers of the inventory and, and do it in a manner where it didn't cost uh, the, the taxpayers, which we did through the redistribution program. Uh, and so that redistribution program was implemented, and we did redistribute 100 percent of the vehicles. Uh, and there's, uh, that's, that we're happy to say that that's complete. That had to happen very late last night, because as of 7 o'clock last night, we still had phone calls from dealers saying, we have cars, and they won't take them back. So We, we will take every car. We will redistribute any car. We've made that comment. We've, we've had written notices. It's been in the Senate. It's been in the newspaper. Uh, we will continue to provide the dealers information and evidence of that. We have redistributed the cars uh, to other dealers. They physically may not all have left the lots, uh, because we weren't able to begin moving them until yesterday, when the new company formed. Uh, but we are at it, and uh, anybody who has that, please give them my name. I'd be happy to talk to them. Okay, we will. And I know you mentioned taxpayers. Every one of these dealers are taxpayers, too. Mr. Barton, for questions, please. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, there's another hearing going on, and so I've been kind of shuttling back and forth. I also need to alert Mr. Blankenbeckler that uh, there's a plane to Texas calling my name. So. Uh, I may I may leave after the, these questions. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Press and and Mr. Um, Henderson, uh, and y'all may have already answered this, but is there a uh, established set of criteria for evaluation of which dealerships were to be closed and and which were to be left open? Do y'all have actual criteria in writing on how you evaluated? dealerships for closure are, are remain opening? Uh, yes, sir, we do, and we submitted those last night, actually. Okay. The same for you, Mr. Press? Yes, sir, we do. Did the dealers know of these uh, criteria? Uh, in, in our case, they were not notified of the criteria uh, prior to the notification. Okay. What about you, Mr. Henderson? In, in our case, uh, we, we uh, have identified what the criteria are, but in fairness, haven't weighted that. So the dealers don't necessarily know what the weighting of all the individual criteria are, the two most important of which are sales effectiveness and customer satisfaction. But, Mr. Barton, if I may, you said you submitted them last night. To who? Uh, to the staff, uh, I think, of this committee. Uh, we this can, committee? We, we, yeah, we can, we can resubmit them. Yeah, we don't have them. That's okay. We will, we'll get them to you if you don't have them now. I, well, I think well, well, the point is, though, you're under, we're Go under ahead. oath, and uh, I, I don't want people to think that we're holding something back here. Uh, we don't have any criteria agreements. Well, I, I think we have just established one of the puzzlements. Sorry. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's somewhat unfair to Mr. Blankenbeckler and Mr. Thomas yeah, and the other dealers see. to be told that their dealerships are going to be uh, revoked, and yet they didn't have any prior knowledge of the analysis and the criteria that were being used, and apparently to this day don't have the knowledge. Um, Mr. Blankenbeckler, do you think that's a fair way to run a railroad? No. Okay. Mr. Thomas? I, I think it's been an opaque process. So, I mean, you know, that's one of, the, one of the problems. I hope Mr. Henderson and Mr. Press realizes uh, if I may, is this the document? Yeah, this I apologize, one sir. Yes, this is the document. On page three of the document, we outline the dealer performance score, and, our, and the weightings are actually in there. 50 percent sales, 30 percent customer satisfaction. It's on page three of the document. One time. All right, well, staff took this as just a uh, PowerPoint presentation. They didn't apologize. realize this was a criteria you used. This and, and after looking at it, they didn't think it helped much. But So this would be the criteria you said you used then? Yeah, this was the dealer performance right. that we We have copies made. Give it to everybody here. Uh, sorry, Mr. Barton. Will. Mr. Blankenbeckler, since you've received your two letters, has anybody from either company, Chrysler or GM, come to you 
and said we want to um, explain why we've done what we've done and we want to give you a chance to uh, show us the error of our ways and and uh, if you wish to continue a business relationship here's what you need to do no they have not okay. uh, mr. Henderson and mr. Prest do you think it would be a um, reasonable business practice to give dealers that have in some cases had decades of relationships with the companies that you had some opportunity to know why they were evaluated the way they were and give them some opportunity to to show why they may have been evaluated unfairly uh, yes sir I, I do and I would like to add that uh, because of the fact that our notification was coincidental with the bankruptcy action uh, and a lawsuit that was brought uh, and the fact that we couldn't have a lawyer in an active lawsuit involved in every discussion, uh, we were not in a position to do that until today, yesterday, uh, and we are more than happy uh, to uh, have those discussions going forward now that that uh, lawsuit has been finalized. Mr. Henderson, would you like to comment on that? Y yes, sir. As of yesterday, we had received 856 requests to reconsider our decision. As I said in my testimony, we reversed 45 of them. Uh, we had expected to complete that review by today, but given the number of uh, the number of requests, we're planning to work through the weekend into Monday to finish this, and certainly are willing and open to consider any, any all requests for reconsideration. Okay. Mr. Blankenbeckler, you don't have to answer this question if you don't wish to, but you have told me privately uh, the amount of uh, investment you have in your dealership. Uh, if you wish to acknowledge that. I, I would appreciate it if you would, but in any event, even if you don't, do you feel that before that investment, which has been built up over 84 years, is just wiped out, that you should have some opportunity to get some remuneration or at least have a reasonable discussion about remuneration uh, with GM and Chrysler? I can't imagine why that wouldn't be the case in this country. I don't, I don't see how that as I said in my statement, I don't, I don't see how that can happen. Could you give a, a general parameter of the uh, the amount of the investment your family has made in these two dealerships over the years? You don't have to if you don't I, want to. I, I really don't care to uh, state that. I, I'll just uh, state for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, it's a, I, I'm not any different than, I mean, it's it's uh, a large sum of money. It is, for, it, for, for it, it is orders for, of magnitude more than my net worth, Mr. Chairman. I'll put it that way. With that, my time's expired and I yield back. But I, I, I do want to thank our witnesses. I want to thank again our chairman. Uh, and, I, and I do hope, when talking directly to Mr. Henderson and Mr. Press, you'll come up with some protocol that dealers like Mr. Blankenbeckler that wish to continue a relationship are given a fair opportunity to present their case. I hope you'll do that. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Uh, Mr. Braley for questions. Mr. Press, do you know a Jennifer Fox? I, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I may. I don't. If you could put some uh, more Does text. Do you know a Jennifer Fox who works in Chrysler's Washington, D.C. office? Um, yes. And I don't know her last name. All I right. Jennifer, I assume if she uses an email address that ends in Chrysler.com, that's an employee of Chrysler. I, I, I assume yes. Are you aware that Chrysler is attempting to convince Chrysler dealers who have not been terminated to engage in a lobbying effort to point out the positive aspects of the consolidation through bankruptcy that has been going on? I'm, I'm aware of the fact that, uh, that because of the uh, publicity that's been provided, that there are 2,391 dealers who have benefited and do and are dealers and give to Little League and are long-time, 100-year-long dealers uh, who want an opportunity to also make their position known, sir. So are you aware that Chrysler has been sending out talking points under a heading key messages memo that says things like Chrysler LLC made the appropriate business decision to move forward with a dealer network that overall can be thriving and profitable and the automobile industry cannot support the number of dealers that currently exist and dealers have known that Chrysler wanted to consolidate dealerships and locate all three brands under one roof. 
They started the process more than 100 years ago, and we understand that the process to evaluate, evaluate the dealers was a thorough process based on data-driven metric. And as a dealer moving forward with a new company, I plan to purchase some of the eligible inventory of the rejected dealers. Were you aware that was going on? And that's all in our testimony submitted to you. It's part of the speech. We've had a consistent communication of those points. Uh, the number of dealers asked that they would like to be able to make their, their voice known as well through this, and that well, was provided. Let me just ask you about the one point that dealers have known. This has come up during the testimony today that Chrysler wanted to consolidate dealerships for more than 10 years. If that is truly the case, sir, then can you tell us why that didn't happen in the numbers we've seen until this bankruptcy arose? It, it has been happening, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, great question. I can understand uh, why you'd ask that. The fact of consolidation has been an ongoing process for a number of years. Uh, in fact, a year and a half ago when, when I came, we actually had meetings and dealers were identified. They know which dealers were going to go forward, which locations would be going forward. We gave them a toolbox of, uh, of things in terms of, re of real estate, of tax planning, uh, to facilitate those discussions and transactions, and, and uh, uh, some of them did. Yeah, but you have to agree with me that the, the volume of closed dealerships over that 10-year period paled in comparison to the announcement that grew out of the bankruptcy. Well, Isn't that true? That's because the bankruptcy was caused by the fact that we were made to support specific vehicles for standalone dealers. And the fact that we're now, that we are a failed enterprise, uh, that didn't get carried forward. A new company was formed that's going to go forward. Yeah, that and we'll I understand succeed. that, and I only have five minutes, so I'm going to move on to something else. You talked in that statement about this um, these data-driven metric. Is that the plan, the criteria that Mr. Dingle and Mr. Barton requested? Will those contain the data-driven metrics that you've just identified in this memo? Uh, yes, we and we, we have submitted in our, in our testimony what the uh, criteria is, and we'll provide uh, additional data as requested. Now. In your testimony before the Senate Commerce Committee, you said that Chrysler loses over a billion dollars annual in lost sales opportunities because of underperforming dealers. And Mr. Henderson, you claimed in similar testimony that dealers add $1,000 of cost to every vehicle. So my question for both of you is, do you have financial analysis that was conducted before the decision was made to terminate these dealer franchises that supports those allegations you made in your testimony. Mr. Press? Uh, yes, we have the uh, analysis of the uh, sales situation, and the, uh, that's, that does exist. We knew what the number was. And was that submitted as part of your testimony? Of the abs uh, For today's hearing, do uh, we have that information? Uh, you do not have it by dealer. Can you provide it to the committee? Well, that's, uh, we should, there is confidentiality in data that we receive from dealers. All right. Well, uh, I know so that there are, there are means cases. to redact information to protect confidentiality and still provide the information that I'm seeking. If, if there's a way to arrange that, would you agree to provide it to the committee? Yes, as long as it can be okay. done within uh, protecting the dealer's right. rights. The committee, I'm sure, will be happy to work with you. Mr. Henderson, same question for you. Does GM have the data to support the statement that you made that these dealers are costing your company $1,000 per vehicle? Sir, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, it's, we, we have an overall cost of $1,000 per vehicle. That cost is articulated in the same package that we submitted last night. It's approximately $2 billion, 2 million units. And, and do you have the underlying data that was used to make that calculation? And is it in the materials that we have received? Yes, sir. Okay. And so you can identify that for the committee. On page 9, sir. Second to last page. All right. And, and so on that page where you made the calculation, do you have supporting documentation for the conclusions that show the portion for dealer margin, incentives paid directly to dealers, standards for excellence, and on and on. I mean, those numbers aren't just published somewhere as a standard cost factor associated with the sales of each vehicle, are they? Uh, what I outlined in my, in my uh, testimony, sir, is these are costs which over time have come into our structure to provide direct support to dealers. Over time, those are not identified per individual dealer because, in fact, they're provided to all of our dealers. But to the best of our knowledge, our best-in-class 
our best in class competitors do not supply that same set, that same sort of support. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but it seems to me there's still plenty of unanswered questions that the committee needs to explore on this subject. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Uh, with ask unanimous consent to put this document, it's uh, from General Motors that uh, looks like they may have emailed last night. Um, Do we ten pages, the one we've been discussing, without objection. Mr. Chairman, without objection, but uh, I would just make the point it might be helpful for the dealers uh, to be able to see a copy of this Correct. to review. Since it's in the record, we will go ahead and put it on the table if they want to look at it while we're going yeah, here. We that would be make, fine. I think that would be helpful in our part of the record. No. Uh, next, I'll move to Mr. Burgess for questions, please, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got a map here of the United States, and this actually pertains just to Chrysler for, for the moment. It, it looks like uh, what a Republican might want the uh, electoral map to look like, but actually this, <laughs> this reflects closed Chrysler dealers. And, and you see my state of Texas, although we've been relatively spared in the economic downturn, um, our state's been hit pretty hard with these closings. Now, there's a member in uh, a state way up in the Northeast, I think he's the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, that was able to make a phone call and get one of his dealerships or distributors to, to stay open. A and my question is, what is the number that I need to call? Is it 1-800-CARS-R? Tell me who to call so that I can help the dealers that are in my area that have been, uh, been so badly hurt by this. You're asking that for Chrysler? Yes. Uh, I, I don't understand your question. With all great respect for the office, I have to say that I'm not aware of any, uh, any dealer that was ever removed from the list that was submitted to the judge uh, on the 14th. I, I have no knowledge of that, and I would uh, very much like to see uh, if I could get that. Well, it was in all the papers yesterday, and I'm sure we can get you a copy. Barney Frank made a call to one of his, uh, to someone, and got his dealer to stay open. Uh, and again, it's unconscionable with what's going on in this country. I also sit on the Joint Economic Committee. Oh, I'm, I beg your pardon, I was just told he's a GM dealer. So perhaps Mr. Henderson could answer that. Well, actually, it's not a dealer uh, at all. Uh, so Just tell me the telephone number that I call. That's really what I'm after here. Sir, what, uh, what we were asked to do is look at the timing of three after-sales warehouses which belong to General Motors and were part of our restructuring plan, including facilities to be closed. We, we looked at I'm going to interrupt you in the interest of time. Okay. The fact is that a member of Congress made a call and a distributorship was, was not closed. It was slated for closure. It is fundamentally unfair. You see the people that are sitting at this table. You've heard their stories. They represent families back in, in everyone's district across the country. We have to, th this process has to be open and transparent and fair. We have a president who was elected on the promise of transparency and fairness. I don't think that's being delivered right now. Now, who wrote the language of the wind down agreement? Can either of you answer that? In our case, it would have been General Motors, uh, the staff of both the sales organization as well as our council. Who, uh, and for Chrysler? There's no similar agreement. We have a very different situation. We have no wind down agreement. With whom in the White House have either of you communicated um, regarding the, the restructuring of both of your organizations? Uh, the, our restructuring plans uh, have been part of our bankruptcy and part of our application for funds, uh, and as the TARP funds were available through U.S. Treasury. Uh, they've been made aware of our process uh, and discussions, but uh, absolutely operationally, they've not had any input or direction in uh, what we're doing. Would this committee be able to get access to the emails between your company and, and the White House regarding the, uh, the, the restructuring and in, in the case of General Motors, the wind down? Uh, yes, absolutely. Will it be necessary? We, of course, can subpoena if I can convince the chairman to do so, but it would be easier if, if that could just be made available to us. Sir, in, in, in our case, we probably, I have no idea how many that is, uh, but we have been keeping, we would keep some of them that would be subject to litigation hold and some that wouldn't be, but uh, I, I, will, I will come back to you. Well, let me ask you this. Have either of you ever spoken to Brian Deese? I have. Yes. And what about, uh, have you exchanged emails with this individual? Uh, I think so, yes. Uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever addressed one to him. I may have seen some email that he... Mr. Chairman, I would just submit for, that I would be particularly interested in, in, 
in those emails uh, to be made part of the available to the committee and made made part of the record. And I do want to spend some time with Mr. Golden before I finish up. But here's the deal. TARP funds, taxpayer funds, taxpayer funds paid by the employees of these dealerships have gone to fund the closing of these dealerships. I sit on the Joint Economic Committee. We saw employment, unemployment numbers for last month in excess of 9 percent, heading for 10. And what is that number going to look like after you, after you decimate these dealers across the, across the country? Now, that's a rhetorical question. I don't expect an answer. Mr. Golick, I do need to ask you, and I didn't intend to ask this, but your story is so similar to a story that I've heard down in my district, a gentleman being required, badgered, browbeat into buying a dealership, and now he's faced with having to close his original dealership and the one he purchased. Uh, do you know, are you aware of other areas in the country where that occurred? Um, you know, it's general. <laughs> For some reason, there's always some kind of animosity between the factory and the dealer. I, I really don't think that needs to, it doesn't need to be, you know, like Ford right now has no, there's no animosity between the factory and the dealerships. And, they're, and, and I think they're going to come out of this okay. Let me ask you this before my time's up. You said, that, are you getting remuneration from the manufacturer to dispose of your inventory and your light bulbs? Oh, I'd and love to tell wires? you about that. You know, uh, Mr. Press makes it sound like sunshine and lollipops we're going to sell the cars your exact words were invoice minus 350 we're selling the cars for invoice minus the hold back minus the floor plan minus the ppa then minus the 350 we're selling the cars for 1500 below invoice on average we normally sell to the public at invoice that's generally right around there and so we're really taking we're selling the cars for 1500 less than we normally do to the other dealers. What about your parts inventory? Mine hasn't been addressed yet. Uh, you know, I I don't know. I'm still in a state of shock over well, everything. I mean, I was told when Chrysler came in to see me yesterday evening was in anticipation of this hearing, and I was told they took care of all of their dealers that they were closing. Inventories would be purchased, cars would be purchased, parts inventories would be yeah, purchased. Is that your experience? Wh what needs to be understood, we don't there's no written procedure as to how we're going to get paid for these cars. Like, thank God, I only have two new cars left, but some dealers got a half a million dollars worth of cars. And from what we hear, the cars are going to be trucked away, and then we're going to wait for the money somehow. I don't, I haven't seen anything on paper that says how we're going to get paid. Now, that's a very important aspect of everything here. I, you know, I, is there a written procedure? Uh, first of all, I'd like to respond. Last question, Mr. Burgess. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Press. I, I'd really like to respond to the issue about the re, the reimbursement. Right, the buybacks. Uh, or the, the dealers are being reimbursed what they paid for the vehicle. What it, the vehicle cost them less $350. Uh, the word invoice is when we invoice the dealer, right. th their invoice includes these holdbacks that we collect and give back to them. But the, they're being paid what they paid us, less $350. Uh, with 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 re yes, sir. Yeah, that's just for 09. And oh, fifteen hundred dollars for 08. For 08, okay. yes. For the uh, in terms of the process, uh, we have uh, published to the dealers the process for the redistribution. We have asked the dealers to sign an agreement uh, that would allow us to take that responsibility. Some of the dealers have done that. Some of them haven't. About 78 still haven't. But all the other dealers have been notified what the process is, uh, and it's uh, it's available for for them to understand that, that it can be used. Mr. Spitzer, I, I know you're jumping here to jump in on this one, but then I'm going to have to go to get. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, from from Burgess. Yeah. Speaking in the mic, please. Excuse me, excuse me, Congressman. You'd asked the question if Mr. Golick knew of other dealers in similar situations. Of our of our seven stores that were terminated, three of them were Project Genesis stores. Uh, one of them was underway. We purchased a piece of land at Chrysler's insistence for 1.6 million dollars in a reorganization of the Akron market and then that and that store was in an area that they wanted to get away from and we're operating interim while we're in, while we're undergoing construction they and they agreed to hold off construction because of the market conditions for one more year and then they canceled the franchise we still own the dirt and and they're and they're cancel penalizing us for product for results in an area that they want us to get out of. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I know time that's, is it, it's up. I just, I, this just cries out for further investigation. I I hope this committee will do a much a, a very thorough job as to what's been going on here. Again, in Texas, it looks like we've cleared the decks. I don't know who we're clearing them for. 
someone is likely to make a great deal of money off the reemergence of Chrysler. I'd like to know who that is and, and what's in the plan and what's in the works. I have a nagging suspicion that there is a political calculation here, and it is extremely distasteful when you look at these gentlemen who have had what I think unconstitutional takings of their private property. And I'll yield back. Ms. DeGette, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Press, I wanted to ask you if Chrysler has a similar set of written criteria um, as GM does for its closures. I'm not familiar with this document, but uh, what we does, do have do, Okay, let me ask you this. Criteria. Does GM have a written set of procedures? I, I'm sorry, does Chrysler have a written set of, of procedures for its closures? We, we, yes or no? We, yes, we've published and, that. And does this committee have that? Uh, it's been published. It was in uh, testimony. Do you know if this committee has it, yes or no? Uh, I can't answer that. Okay. Um, Mr. Dingo suggests that we have you submit that for the record, and uh, we would appreciate that. If you don't have it, I will. Thank you very much. Um, secondly, um, I, you know, I, I heard both of your gentlemen, Mr. Henderson and Mr. Press's testimony about um, what could make a dealer profitable, that it could be coming from selling used cars or parts or service or other things. So I, get, I guess my question, and I'll start with you, Mr. Henderson, is um, if a dealer is profitable um, and it's buying cars from the manufacturer, which it's then selling, what does it matter if that profit center is derived from the service center, used sales, or new cars? Mr. Henderson? Good question. Uh, Thank you. First, in, in, our, in the case of the dealers who are impacted in our wind down situation, 69% of them were not profitable. From, from my no, no. My question I is understand. if a dealership is profitable, then what should you care about what center that profit is de deriving from? Very quickly, please. In general, uh, we look at overall profitability, not individual centers. Right. So but if a dealer is profitable from whatever source and buying cars from GM, why would you care if it's if it why, I mean if it's profitable why not let it stay in business if a dealer is profitable we don't care if it's from parts right or so after. why would you close a, a dealership like because that not in all cases are profitable dealers for example have high levels of customer satisfaction oh so now it's customer satisfaction there were multiple okay. criteria yes ma'am okay what about you Mr. Press what, what's your answer to that question uh, my answer is first of all uh, we have too many dealers and but the, why, why would you care if they're profitable and buying cars from Chrysler? Because the only way we're going to survive is to have all three franchises up under one roof. The only okay. way any dealers will survive okay. will, will be to have try branding, first of all. So, your so one criteria is they have to have all three brands uh, under one roof, right? Directionally, that's the position that we're going to achieve. Okay, let as, me stop as you right one, there. one, but that's not the only okay. one. And then you can talk about the other one. In Colorado, Chrysler has terminated five of the seven top performing dealers, including John Medved's Chrysler store in Castle Rock, which is not in my district, but it's south of my district. They sell all three brands under one roof. Mm -hmm. So what would you, and, and they're profitable. So what would you say to them? I, you probably don't know each I, specific. Uh, I think it's difficult to get into going through each individual deal. No, but but, but what what would your criteria uh, be for a store like that? Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure if I understand that you say they're the top performing store. I don't know what that means. Uh, there may be a five of the seven top. The Chrysler Chrysler dealerships are five of the seven top performing dealers in Colorado, and and so so this Medved dealership in Castle Rock is is profitable and it has all three brands under one roof. So so for people like them, not them in sure. particular. Of course, if, if what would your next what what would another criteria be? One criteria was if it's not top performing, it's costing us sales if they're under their minimum sales. Okay, so it need to be top performing. It well, need Farming. It well, need to have all three, and what else? They have to have a minimum sales responsibility covered, so okay. they, that we're not losing uh, uh, money and revenue in that store. And is that minimum sales responsibility covered in your written policies that have been distributed and which you're going to provide uh, yeah, to us? Yeah, minimum sales responsibility is a basic part of our agreement. The dealers all know what that is. Okay. So, so it's in their agreement. It, it could also be that the market that they're in is no longer viable. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we've gone from 2 million units to 700,000. Right. We don't have enough available product to support all the dealers in every market. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I, I understand what you're saying, 
but like Castle Rock, I'm going to tell you, is one of the fastest growing areas. Douglas County, Colorado is one of the fastest growing counties in the country. So I, I guess, you know, without getting into the particulars, I know you don't know the particulars of each single one, but I heard you say that, that, that unlike GM, Chrysler does not have an appeal process. So my basic question to you is, do these dealers know, people like Medved, do they know exactly why their dealership was terminated? Have they been given that information? Uh, because of the, the proceeding in bankruptcy and the fact that this coincided with a lawsuit, we were not in a position to tr communicate. Uh, and I, I want to clarify, because that was asked before, that uh, now that we've come out of bankruptcy, we are in a position, we will communicate uh, to the dealers and, and let them know uh, what the factors are. And we, we would, uh, so we had a very robust process it was fair and equitable. It was tested and approved by the bankruptcy judge, by the appeals but court the, in but, New York, and okay. the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and but, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to allow uh, committee members to see the same information. Okay. And uh, uh, it's difficult, but we can go through individual dealers as you wish. We but but, 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 but you, what you would say is that you did not tell these dealers before exactly why they were terminated. So you can understand why Absolutely. they are upset. I understand their anger and upset. I okay. can understand to the in my soul the whole situation. Being bankrupt, it's not a spectator sport. Well, obviously. And, you know, I used to be a lawyer in a different life. I don't know of any provision in the bankruptcy rules that says you can't tell people. Maybe that was the bankruptcy judge that told you not to tell people. But it seems to me you need to give people the information. Well, we do. It was a, there was a lawsuit filed as part of that bankruptcy on behalf of, of the dealers, and it became very difficult for information other than discovery to go forward. Now that we're out of bankruptcy, we are fully prepared to be. What's your time frame for that, sir? Uh, we're fully prepared uh, at, at any point to, to become transparent with the dealers that would like to. So, so you can get that out, what, in the next week, you think? Uh, perhaps sooner. That's great. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. That. Chairman. Mr. Doyle for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and I am a co-sponsor of H.R. 2743. It took me about two seconds to sign that one. Is your mic uh, on, Mike? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just yeah. got to lean qu closer, I guess. Mr. Press, I'm trying to understand this. So, so you're saying that you have uh, a very objective methodology to determine what dealers survived and what dealers didn't. I mean, you could feed the dealer data into a computer and then you had this very objective criteria and then the computer would spit out without any, you know, it, it was it that kind of a deal? I mean, or, or, or was there any subjective part to this? Uh, we have uh, over 200 people in the field from local markets uh, that were part of the process of collecting the appropriate information. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a data service that provides demographic and location information and identification of future trends. Uh, we have the process of understanding what franchises that we have, the criteria from the dealers' uh, own uh, scorecards. It's a, a number of pieces of information. Uh, it wasn't just a computer. It was vetted uh, through a number of levels oh, okay. of consideration. Okay, thanks. So, so one of the criteria is you wanted to, you know, why, why would a dealer who had maybe two of your three brands uh, and was a performing dealer uh, and a profitable dealer, why wouldn't they be given the opportunity to just pick up you know, that you start selling the third brand to them. Sure. Uh, I mean, what stops you from doing that? Well, there's a couple reasons. Uh, uh, one of them, of course, uh, is that you don't want to have two dealers that may be next door to each other selling the same products. I don't think the dealers really want that either. Uh, in fact, there are some laws that provide 10-mile separation, uh, which should be respected. Uh, and so we, we've got to be careful to craft the right dealer network going forward that has the distance and the appropriate market so the dealers can survive. Um, and, the, and normally, bec many of these locations where we have the single brand dealerships, they're in so close proximity uh, that they have to be brought up into one. That means that one dealer may be chosen and one may not. Uh, we have here that process where the dealers that weren't chosen are in front of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Golick, you, you sold two of the three brands, right? Yeah. Now, this minimum sales deal, have, have, have you met that? Yes, I've always been at a... Uh by the way, there are two criteria, two main criteria that a 
a manufacturer can use to terminate a dealership under the state franchise laws. And the two main things are your minimum sales responsibility and your minimum working capital requirements. We've always been at 150 percent of both of those. And there's one other criteria, and it's taking care of the customer, your customer satisfaction. And we've always been just about the highest in the state. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to submit for the record, uh, there's a site called dealerrater.com where you can go on and, and, and look up dealerships and, and they do ratings. Uh, I have Golic Jeep here who uh, consistently has a five out of a possible five customer satisfaction. Their 24-month rating, by the way, is 5.0, the highest you could get. I have another dealer here, I won't name them out of respect for them, also in the same market area that was kept. Uh, that their dealer rating is one on, on a scale of, of one to five. Uh, this is a surviving dealer. Mr. Golick's a dealer that's been, and I like to submit these uh, ratings for the record. Uh, Without Mr. objection. Golick, uh, I want you to grab that book there that's on the table and turn to tab 14 uh, on that book. Now, if you're looking at tab 14, uh, it, this is an article that appeared in Automotive News on February 5th, 2009. And it describes a conference call at which Mr. Press, the president of Chrysler, urged dealers to buy 15,000 cars from the company in order to save it. Now, let me read you to what Mr. Press reportedly said to the dealers. Quote, you have two choices. You can either help us or you can burn us down. Mr. Golick, are you familiar with this call? Oh, yes, very familiar. All right, let me keep going. The article also quotes Mr. Press as saying this, and I quote, if you decide not to do that, we've got a good memory of who helped us and who didn't. Uh, do you recall that, Mr. Golick? Oh, I very much do. What, how did you feel about that? Did you, did you take that as a threat? I, I never heard that from an auto executive in my life. I, I've been in the business all my life. I, I, I've never heard anything like that out of him. Mr. Golick, as a result, did you buy additional cars? You know what? Uh, I honestly can't remember. I think if I had to uh, look it up, I, I probably did not on that particular month, but I did on the other months. Mm -hmm. um, I think Chrysler could provide you with that, but I just I have a feeling I did not that particular month he said that comment. As I fluffed it off and told my family, I, I said, I couldn't believe this guy said this. So, Mr. Kikenap, did, did you get a similar call? Were you on that call? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, it's, is these quotes that uh, were attributed to Mr. Press in the article, do, do you recall hearing that? Uh, yes, I did. Did you buy cars as a result of that call? No, I did not. How about you, Mr. Spitzer? So in some, I was on the call. In some cases, we bought them. In some of our stores, we just couldn't take them. Mm -hmm. and, and after you and other dealers put up your own money to buy these cars in order to help out the company, you were shut down a few months later. Now, now, let me ask you, Mr. Press, is, is, this, is this an accurate quote in the paper, or you deny saying this? It's accurate. It's accurate? So let me ask you something, Mr. Press. How do you respond? How do, you get on the phone and you ask your dealers to, to help you survive. Uh, you ask them to buy some more cars. You basically say you've got a good memory, and you'll remember the guys that helped you out and the, and the guys that didn't. Uh, can you tell this committee that you didn't use that as one of your criteria to decide what dealers got. If dealers said, that, we take that as a threat and we resent it and we're not going to buy any additional cars, uh, would that be used to maybe retaliate against the dealers? Absolutely not at all in any way, shape, or form. How do you take a statement like we have a good memory of who helps us and who doesn't? Well, if, if, if I made that call to you and asked you that, how would you take that call? May I put that in context? Sure. I, I understand your, your question, and I, and I also fully realize the way that that could be used in a manner that may not be accurate. But the situation was that we had a shutdown in, in, in December uh, before Christmas. We made no production. We had asked for and received a, a very small part of our TARP funds. We had asked for TARP funds to, for the first quarter. We got one month, and we had to uh, extend through February 14th our timing to submit to get additional TARP funds. Uh, in the month of February, we had insufficient production to meet cash flow targets that would have caused the company to liquidate. We had continued and were committed for everyone's sake to avoid bankruptcy and not liquidate the company. And we did make an appeal to the dealers to please understand that we need to buy the February production. I realize that you're not out of cars, but if the company is going to make it through February and we have a chance at getting the TARP funding, which we finally did and we're still here today, 
uh, we, would, we would need that help. 70% of the dealers had purchased cars, 30% hadn't. And my quote was something like, if you don't buy the cars today, we liquidate, we're gone. If we buy the cars and we can stay in business, at least we have a shot at getting to the end of this, at, at end of this tunnel and getting some money. It's like a bucket brigade, and everybody's got a bucket. Seventy of you have. That statement's fine. I don't have a problem with that. And thirty that. of you don't. And then I said, those of us in the bucket brigade will know which ones are in and which ones aren't, using the peer pressure of all of us, recognizing that if who's there. It had absolutely, I am a dealer guy. I would never threaten a dealer. You can ask anybody in the United States that I would never use that pressure. And I promise you, under any oath, that there was never an aspect. And if you ask the people that did not get approved to go forward, they both equally either bought cars or didn't. And that's why we were so insistent on our redistribution program to make sure any dealer that took cars would be re reimbursed. We added incentives. We had the best sales in February after that. We had a retail month for the first time in history. We outsold Ford. We sold those cars. We didn't want the dealers to store them. We wanted to save the company and get to this point where we could emerge from bankruptcy. And, and three months after those guys did Sorry, that, where you, you cut those guys loose. Uh, I, I see my time's up. Ms. Sutton of Ohio for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there are just so many things I'd, uh, I'd like to pursue. But I just want to start, Mr. Henderson. You, uh, you said that GM has an appeal process. We've heard about that. And I just want to ask you why. Why do you have an appeal process? Our, uh, our process was initially certainly is intended to be data driven, but the data isn't always right, which is why I think for we, we felt certainly compelled to have a review process which would reconsider facts that may not have been so clear in the data. And that review process has certainly borne out that it was the right thing to do because there were, there were cases where we were wrong. So would you say it was a, a matter of, of fairness? Yes, we thought it was the fair thing to do. Mm -hmm. And in those decisions where, where uh, your decisions were overturned in the, on the appeals, can you tell us, um, you know, the, the examples? We heard the one about the, uh, the devastation of the bridge that stopped the business from going forward. Can you tell us some uh, other examples of uh, what was overturned? Oh, recently, uh, uh, I don't have the full knowledge of the 45, but another recent example was we had a, uh, a small town that had a Buick and GMC store and a Chevrolet store and the conclusion and, and our initial plan would be to consolidate those two and the conclusion after reconsideration was no let's leave the two for example that would be another one. Um, Mr. Press in light of what we've heard Mr. Henderson say about the need to have a uh, an appeal process because uh, fairness requires it equity requires it um, how do you feel about that in light of the fact that Chrysler has no such thing for uh, those who've been shut out? Uh, interest, great question. I understand the contrast. The fact is, though, that our situations are completely different. But the employees are affected the same way, and the dealerships are affected the same way. Uh, the, they're, both, they're both dealerships, and they're both auto companies, but the factors that led to the appeal process don't exist for Chrysler. And, uh, and that, that's a completely different situation because we, we don't have a term agreement uh, that comes up that has... Uh, w with all due respect, the, the factor that uh, was a determining factor of whether or not they were going to have appeals process was fairness. Mm -hmm. And that applies to Chrysler as well, does it not? Uh, in our case, what we had is a situation where the company went bankrupt. It's a failed enterprise. I understand. Enterprise. I understand. A, a new company uh, was formed to go forward and selected specific dealers based on criteria of beyond dealer performance from a standpoint of a strategic dealer network, uh, the number of dealers, the locations, the number of brands to be. I, I understand the criteria and you, um, but, but again, I think we're leaving out the, the point and the point is both companies have an obligation, I would suggest, to make sure that those who have given a lot uh, in working with your company for many years, decades, upon decades in, in some cases, um, an appeals process as a matter of, of fairness. I understand all the underlying issues. I understand the, the business perspectives here. But what Mr. Henderson just referred to is something that applies to both companies. And that's a matter of, of fairness. And I'll just I'll move on. But I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed because I would suggest, Mr. Press, that 
regardless of your criteria, if it were okay at the inception and it was all uh, uh, perfectly subscribed to uh, in terms of, of being appropriate, you might still make mistakes. So with that, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. I want to clarify a little bit more this whole idea because we hear from the dealers about how um, the dealerships don't feel that they cost the companies a lot of money. Um, so if I could just get uh, from Mr. Press and Mr. Henderson a yes or no answer to these questions. Um, is it true that the dealers pay for the cars before they receive them? Yes. Yes. And is it true that the dealers pay to have the cars shipped to them? Yes. And do the dealers pay for the parts as they receive them? Yes, ma'am. And do the dealers pay for their signs? Yes. Yes. Okay. And do they pay for their buildings, including the taxes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do they pay, obviously, their employees and all of those related taxes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do they pay for the brochures that they hand out in their showrooms? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Press, last week you testified that the dealers cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 billion. Um, have you provided substantiation of that number somewhere? Yes, in our testimony. Okay, that's, that's what you are submitting as the substantiation. We have submitted written testimony. Yes, I, I, am, I, have your, I have your testimony. There's nothing supplemental to provide for any additional substantiation, just your testimony. Yes. Okay. Mr. Press, don't all the states allow you to terminate dealer agreements provided that there is just cause? Uh, it, de it depends on the state. There are different franchise laws that exist. I understand, but do they all provide you uh, with the opportunity to terminate for just cause? Uh, I, I can't, you don't know? I can't okay. answer your question. Fair enough. Okay. How many dealerships did Chrysler terminate last year because of substandard performance? I, I can't answer your question. There were some, but I don't know how many. Okay. Would you please provide that to me? Yes. Because now we have 789 being terminated, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a huge number. So it's, it would be a, interesting. it's not the same reason. It would be interesting to, he, to, to see how many were terminated uh, under the just cause standard in the last year. Um, Mr. Press, did I read correctly that you said that it costs 41000 or in your testimony per dealer to have staff call on dealers, um, or was it some other number? No, it was not just staff, uh, for providing training to have the computer systems, to have uh, our internet uh, program up, to have all of the records inside the dealership, inside our company, um, all the audit information that we have, uh, the computer data. Uh, the field organization, not just a traveler, but we have a, a full field office, transportation, logistics, parts service. Um, a, it's a fairly large uh, enterprise of administrative costs, uh, and, and uh, it's $41,000 per dealer. Okay. Well, I will wait. I'll wait for the next round. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you've been hearing very clearly from Republicans and Democrats uh, who represent dealers that there is enormous concern about how they've been treated and the impact on communities. Uh, one area where there seems to be a dispute uh, on the dais is whether this was a decision. Uh, each of these decisions on closing a dealer was made by Chrysler and GM uh, or was it orchestrated by the White House? And I know you were asked about that in the Senate hearings, and I just, it's very important that it be clear who uh, bears the responsibility here and accepts the responsibility. So, uh, Mr. Henderson, let me ask you, uh, is it in fact the case that the Treasury w was not involved in any way in the selection or the development or guidance on the number of dealers that would be closed? Uh, could you repeat the question, sir? I'm sorry. Basically, the question is who made the decision on how many dealers to close and which dealers to close? Management. And that is you yes. making that decision uh, according to your best judgment about what was the in the interest of General Motors, correct? Yes, sir. And Treasury was not involved? 
Treasury was involved as a purchaser in making sure we had a properly sized dealer body, but they were not involved in individual decisions nor what the exact number should be. All right. So you will acknowledge that that decision, whether it was right or wrong, is a decision that you made, not the White House? Yes, sir. All right. And how about you, Mr. Press? Same question. Uh, it's correct. It was not made by the White House. It was made by our company, Chrysler. Okay. So <clears throat> the basic question here is not just a matter of fairness, although I agree with my colleagues on that. It's a matter of business judgment. And somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Uh, you two gentlemen, on behalf of your companies, have come to the conclusion that closing down long dealers, including uh, dealers in good standing who have done a good job for a long time, in some cases generations, uh, that it's in the interest of the company to close them down. Is that right? In our case, it's the only way we'll survive going forward. And there's uh, obviously a lot of evidence that's been presented to you at this hearing that those dealers are not costing you money but actually can be a lifeline uh, to re-energize sales in their local community. So uh, you're going to bear the responsibility uh, if, in fact, it turns out that you're wrong and they're right, correct? Yes, we will bear the responsibility. And on this appeal question, I mean, here's the dilemma that we have. The bankruptcy code is brutal. I mean, this man over here, is his grandfather uh, was in the business, his father was in the business, and had there not been the resort to bankruptcy, uh, which was obviously made uh, as a result of uh, uh, business situations that developed over decades, had there not been a resort to uh, bankruptcy, you would have had to have a sit-down, face-to-face interaction with people that had been loyal, effective, and solid business partners for decades, correct? The bankruptcy was caused by a, a market that ended and no credit. It not was not asking about the cause. But, Once uh, you go into bankruptcy, all the rules that used to apply, contracts, agreements, relationships, are thrown out the window. The law allows it to be, uh, happen, it's, but it's, a brutal, it's the nuclear option, correct? It's, uh, it, it was not a desire or a plan. It was a, a failed enterprise that stopped operating, uh, and it's, it doesn't exist any longer. Right. And what it did is allow the court to throw out contract law that had applied or uh, state statutes that provided some equity between the dealers and the company. And here's the question. I mean, you're not responsible for what bankruptcy law is. This is the question you and Mr. Henderson. Given the fact that uh, bankruptcy is a brutal tool, uh, in some cases it may be necessary. Do you believe that that entity, in General Motors and Chrysler, which resorts to bankruptcy, you know, for the best of intentions, I'll stipulate that for the moment, should bend over backwards on the side of giving the benefit of the doubt to dealers that have been loyal, effective, and largely profitable partners uh, to the manufacturers. I can't really speak on what the bankruptcy court should or shouldn't do. I can I'm not asking say, what they should I can or shouldn't only say, do. I'm uh, asking what the, comp the company should or shouldn't do. The reason why we developed our approach to wind down agreements was to try to handle this as responsibly as we could. Well, bottom line here is the law probably allows you to do what you're doing. And I have no doubt that uh, you've probably made a decision which you think is consistent with the exercise of your responsibilities. You've got tough jobs. But we've got a unique situation here where the brutal unfairness of the law is imposing enormous, uh, frankly, unspeakable hardship on some pretty good people. And you'll acknowledge, I'm sure, that you're fallible and you made your best judgment but that doesn't guarantee you're right. And the request I have of you is whether, in the exercise of your judgment, you will give the benefit of every doubt that can possibly be given to people who have been doing a good job for a long time. This was not using the law. Uh, with great respect, I understand how that could be construed, but the fact of the matter is uh, a new company was formed in our particular case and a certain number of dealers with certain locations and certain brand representation were selected to go forward. Uh, the, the, the cause of this is that Cotton became a failed enterprise. Okay. 
I and yield back. Thank you. Uh, there's interest here. We're going to go another round. Um, Mr. Henderson, let, let me ask you this. Uh, Canada is part interest of the new General Motors, right? Canada is part interest? Yes, sir. Are, are we closing dealerships in Canada? Uh, yes, we actually went through a very similar process. Okay. And have you had hearings and things like that up in Canada? No, we did not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Press, we got the new Chrysler and the old Chrysler. Will the new Chrysler dealers require to sell Fiat's? Will the new Chrysler dealers require to sell Fiat's? Yeah. Uh, we, we have not yet established a, a, a brand position and a product plan going forward uh, of exactly what products uh, Will, from our alliance will be branded Fiat or branded some other brand. They will but be made in... Uh, in wasn't that one of Fiat's considerations for helping out here with the new Chrysler is to get their product line in, in the United States? Well, uh, part of the new company is definitely going to benefit from the $10 billion worth of resources and, and product development and hardware from Fiat that gives us tremendous car entries uh, in technology that we'll bring into our product line. Sure, but, but are you required to sell Fiat's? That's what I'm asking. Uh, well, we, we're going to have cars that have Fiat technology or engines. Right. Uh, right. And but a car that says Fiat. Uh, there may be, we have not yet determined uh, which brands or what names will be on the vehicles. Could, a vehicle could have a Fiat yeah. name on it. Uh, it may not, it may have a Chrysler name on it. Mr. Barton said, and, and, and just for left, and he said, you know, I, I hope Chrysler and General Motors review some of these dealerships and maybe some of these things can be reversed. In all honesty, because you went through the bankruptcy, there is no way for any of these Chrysler dealerships that are being closed to, to get their cars, dealerships back, is there? That's correct. I, and my, my answer to him was that we would be transparent and share with them the information so they could well, understand. Well, why they're closed, but, but we got to be honest here, none of these gentlemen here are going to get their dealerships That's back. That's correct. And there was no appeal process for them to get their dealerships back. That's correct. If, and, and that's the bankruptcy, those contracts were broke, uh, and therefore you don't have to offer them anything else, correct? Uh, the, the dealerships, those contracts, franchise agreements were broken, they're done, bankruptcy discharged them. But we took responsibility for the redistribution of the uh, right. inventories. Okay. See, so that's sort of what bothers me. That's old Chrysler. Those were old Chrysler parts. So how can the new Chrysler, if it's not going to, give these gentlemen a, an appeal process or even consider taking them back. How can the new Chrysler take stuff that was old Chrysler? It seems like you're being selective in what you're going to take. Uh, uh, sir, that's a great question. The redistribution is to dealers, not to our company. So what we did is a, a provided for a distribution of the vehicles that were in uh, old Chrysler dealers uh, inventory and they're being moved into new Chrysler dealers inventory. Okay, the $350 I got to pay to get my 09 Chrysler moved off my lot since I'm being closed. Who gets that money? Where's that money go? That goes for the inspection, uh, the cleaning of the vehicle, and for the transportation, the logistics. It's an outside third party company. Okay, so New Chrysler doesn't receive that money or distributes that money in any way? No, sir. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Mr. Question? Keegan can. Um, uh, you can't ask a question, but if you got a statement, go ahead. No. Uh, you can't ask questions, sorry. Um, Mr. Henderson, let me ask you this. Did, did you have a conference call on June 10th with GM executive retirees? Yes. Two, two days ago, yeah. Yes. W w was the statement made along these lines, I don't have it exactly, that no executive level GM retiree will receive a hundred, uh, retirement benefit package more than $100,000 at the direction of the Treasury Department or the Auto Task Force? The uh, discussion had to do with uh, pensions that apply to executives' non-qualified plans. Correct. As part of a total number of liabilities, one of which was that, there were six liabilities that were unfunded and unsecured. And as part of our bankruptcy filing, uh, the purchase and sale agreement suggested that we would have to reduce the total amount of those liabilities by two-thirds. 
then management had the responsibility to allocate the two-thirds reduction. So as part of doing that, we, we, we identified a plan with respect to the, the uh, salary, excuse me, for executive retirees, that any executive retiree whose combined qualified and non-qualified benefit was less than $100,000, they would be unaffected. And to the extent that their benefits in total were more than $100,000, the extent of the unqualified plan would be reduced by two-thirds. Okay. What well, was that a decision made by General, the new General Motors, or is that decision made by Treasury Department? The overall framework was part of the purchase and sale agreement, so the purchaser had, had identified what amount of liabilities that they were prepared to accept. The actual recommendation to how to allocate that, including this particular recommendation, was management's. Uh, General Motors management then? Yes, sir. Okay. So to place the blame for that on the White House Task Force or a Treasury Department wouldn't be accurate? In the case of an uh, unqualified uh, pension such as this, sir, uh, we had identified, we had, we had indicated to our retirees that in most bankruptcies that's zero. Okay. And so in this particular case, uh, this was considered to be a fair approach to it. Um, today is June 12th. That's the day that the wind down agreements have to be returned to General Motors in Detroit, right? Yes, sir. So, so of, of those dealers that are going forward <coughs> or are going to be lost, closed. What happens if they don't sign it? Well, first of all, <coughs> excuse me, 96% uh, today, uh, as of today, uh, this morning, excuse me, uh, had either signed it or had verbally said it was coming in. So we anticipate a high percentage of those dealers will sign the wind-out agreements. Right. Very high percentage. In the event that they don't, uh, those contracts would not be assumed by the new company. They would be left in the old company and they would be rejected. So they would basically be out of business anyways? They could terminate their contract, yes. But any financial incentives that would be in the wind down agreement would be lost? Correct. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Walton. So, so they are not signing that under duress? <laughs> the well, they are not, but, but if well, there is a thousand more dealers that are, are, are going to be closed, right? A thousand more GM dealers. So if I do not get my contract in right away or protest too loudly, I could be one of those thousand other dealers. Well, actually, in terms of the participation agreement, 99 percent of those are in. We expect to have all of them in. Uh, Mr. Spitzer, did you want to, or did you have something to say on this? Uh, not on the, well, I had a couple of comments. One on the, on the uh, 41,000, Mr. Press. Uh, I would submit that the, the cost per dealer will go up after these dealers are terminated. Sure. Because many of the, uh, first of all, by, I think it's maybe 40 percent or so get no representation at all. It's all done electronically. The smaller dealers, there's no personnel. I, I, I would also submit that they'll cut very few fee field people, if any, with fewer dealers. Those costs are almost fixed, or at least semi-fixed, that will go up. The other comment I was going to make was the minimum sales responsibility. Just to quickly um, educate the, in a, just in a couple of sentences, the, the committee. Uh, they take the uh, state average penetration for their uh, brands and they expect every dealer to hit state average penetration. The problem with that is, and just to take, take an exaggerated, not exaggerated, an example of, of how that can be skewed and how it's an unfair measurement. In fact, common fleets, complete courts, at least in Ohio, have found, and there's rooms full of, of uh, testimony, expert testimony, and they have been thrown out, in many cases, minimum sales responsibility as a criteria. In, in Sheffield, one of the terminated, rejected stores in, in the Congresswoman Sutton's district, there is a Dodge dealership in the middle of Ford country. There's two Ford plants. One of them was just shuttered, but still a lot of eight plan residual buyers that are still owners that are still there living there, retirees and so forth, and then a pl plant still, still going in Avon Lake. This dealership is right between them. Okay, 100 miles to the west, there's another dealership near a Jeep plant in Toledo, Ohio. The dealer in Toledo and, and my dealership in Sheffield is held to exactly the same standard. That's absurd. I see. Uh, one more question. I'm going to go to Mr. Walden. Uh, Mr. Henderson, does GMAC have part of the new GM? Or does GM own still own part of GMAC financing? Uh, 
GM will own uh, shares in the new in, in GMAC. Uh, we have we will own approximately 9.9 percent once we have the other remaining are shares that General Motors are currently held in a trust to be sold because as part of our passivity agreement with the Fed we agreed we would sell down our interest to 9.9 percent. Mr. Walden for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I want to just pick up on the GMAC part then, but I got to find it. Um, so I've talked to a, a, a lot of folks uh, in, in my district and. One of their complaints is the flooring issue with GMAC. And I had a, a dealer tell me that uh, after GMAC got their government dollars due the flooring, they immediately raised the interest rate by 6 percent. They made this dealer pay $10,000 just to be able to stay on. It's non-refundable. He'd been with them 27 years, had no problems. In the last seven months, they've changed his contract 14 times, always with the threat of curtailment and then micromanage and manipulate his floor stock. He told me, they, they told him he had too many cars, so he cleaned out his inventory, sent them to auction. Then they called to say that they had had an inspection and his car numbers were inaccurate. He said, I did what you asked. They said, you should call us to tell us you're doing what we ask. <laughs> he said it would be illuminating to have a congressional member in the room listening to the dealer conversation with the GMAC employee. This is not unique, unfortunately, in terms of that side of this issue. Um, I, I also want to go on to, uh, well, let me go to, to Mr. Thomas, because you've now had a chance, and, and, and maybe Mr. Uh, Blankenbeckler as well, you've now had a, a brief opportunity to look at the criteria. Is this the first time you've seen the criteria upon which uh, the decision was made in your wind-down agreement? Um, it is the first time I've seen the DPS one other time uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, I, I have asked for things that are in this paper prior to making the wind down uh, <clears throat> agreement commitment, and it would appear that I made the wrong decision. Uh, How so? Well, it says that in, a, in the case of a rejected dealer. What page are you on so uh, the committee can follow? This is uh, page five. Uh -huh. It says uh, at the very bottom for GM dealers that floor plan with GMAC, which unfortunately we are floored with uh, Wells Fargo, uh, and I don't know if this would pertain or not, but it says for GM dealers that floor plan with GMAC, if the dealer agreement is rejected, we expect that the dealer would, re would turn in new vehicle inventory, which would GM then would redistribute. Now, this idea of playing out for 17 months it sounds good and, uh, and, and compassionate in a sense, perhaps for the employees, but uh, it's a hard sell to convince someone why they should buy uh, a past model car from you when you're not even going to be there. I mean, that's tough. And the, the Was it hard to sell a, a model car from a manufacturer who people weren't convinced was going to be there? That as well. Did that affect your sales, do you think? It has affected them. Was that? Do you think that was taken into account when it comes to? I I think there's some uh, something has been taken into account, but I I don't really see it as being sufficient. I we took uh, four cars to auction about a year ago, two Cadillacs, and two Corvettes, and we stood to lose sixty-five thousand dollars on four automobiles. And a year if I ago. Project that forward. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. So do, do you feel like this information provided to the committee uh, is it would give you an adequate understanding of how they evaluated the wind down agreements versus the go forward agreements? Is this all that? And I, I guess that's uh, well. I'll let you answer that. Well, the whole I, the whole document. I, I the uh, uh, it's I asked specifically for a definition of what would be my fate in this state of rejection. And it was really, it was, there were really two choices. I mean, you were, if you were, yeah, wind down, you could either fall into the, you know, sign the wind down agreement, very tough right. language, or fall into rejection and no definition of what that really meant. So you didn't know what the option really was then? Well, I, I asked for it. Uh, and did you get I, it? I did not get something as thorough as this. I got, uh, you know, uh, rather uh, short answers. Uh, I, I had asked on the email question line, I asked 
about Mr. Henderson's comment about redistributing inventory that I think were made uh, in the Senate hearings. Uh, the email response comes back. Uh, uh, this you're going to have to call the call center. I call the call center. Uh, they don't have information about that uh, comment or its implication. So, Mr. Henderson, do you want to answer in, in, Mr. Thomas's yes, question? Yes, sir. Uh, in the case of vehicles, where first thing I would say is that the uh, total compensation in the wind down agreement is is intended in all cases to be superior to termination. That's the reason why there's such a high percentage. Second is if someone chooses to voluntarily terminate, and we have people dealers doing that today. We had 50 dealers last month voluntarily terminate. Even in fact, you say 80 a month on average will fact, terminate. We had 50 last month with people knowing this agreement was 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 there. What happens in that case to the extent that they floor plan their, their cars with GMAC, GM has an obligation and an agreement with GMAC that the dealer can turn their cars back to GMAC and then we will redistribute the cars. That's how it works. Is and that if you're with a bank for flooring? We yeah. don't we don't have such agreement with it would be it would have to be bank by bank. With the high the highest percentage of our dealers are floor plan with GMAC. So what's that mean for you, Mr. Thomas? I would have to talk to my bank. I my presumption is that they don't have that. that do you have that agreement with Bank of America or Wells Fargo? Or I don't, I don't know. I'd have to follow up. Uh, but this again would would apply only in the case of a, of a termination, actually, as opposed to wind down. In the wind oh. down, uh, we would continue to uh, work with the dealers through October of ten. You know, and I, I guess the question, and I, I realize my time's over here, but uh, to to both the the GM dealers in wind down. What effect does it have on your ability going forward not to be able to have a, uh, the new product line going into this next year? You're, you're still going to be w with a lot there, right? Well, we will, and we won't have the current offerings, and it's, you know. They'll How does that help GM then? I, I, I don't understand that part. What am I missing here? How does that, how does them not be able to buy your new model vehicles help the 2010 vehicles? First help? of all, uh, the one element of our wind down agreement that, that we needed to apply was that they couldn't know, they could no longer purchase new vehicles. They could purchase used vehicles, they could purchase parts to provide service. Why, what, what, my question was why? What, help me understand why that makes sense from your, you want, you make money by selling vehicles you make, right? Mm -hmm. They make money by then turning around and selling those same vehicles. So why wouldn't you want them buying your 2010 vehicles, even though they're, then it's their problem? I mean, right? They, they go out of business at the end of January of, the or October of 2010. The purpose of the wind-down agreement, we did provide as part of compensation, for example, incremental uh, resources for the vehicles they had in inventory. And this was pro about a providing a 17-month period to wind down their, their facility in an orderly basis as opposed to replenishing new stock. And we would have a problem at the end of the contract. Huh. My my sense is that the, when the model change occurs, You're everything done. that we have will be yesterday's news. And it'll be very hard to get from October 20, 2009 to October 2010. And I guess that gets to my point. I, I didn't mean I've, I've been kidded a bit up here because apparently I asked you if you felt terminated, Mr. Thomas. I meant to say if you felt your dealership had been terminated. Um, <laughs> It, it, I guess that's what I'm trying to get. Isn't that exactly what's happened here? In effect, it's a much shorter term. term. I realize you, you're buying some things out and all, but in effect, it's taken effect this fall, right? But Mr. That's my sense, yes. Mr. Mr. Blankbecker, do you track it the same way? Yes. Uh, in re regards to the handout that was just given out, To my not, I, I could get no information uh, to speak of uh, in regards to what your fate was should you not sign the wind down agreement. I was repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly called by GM. Where is your agreement? Where is your agreement? Where is your agreement? Do you understand? I said, I can read. I know what it says. And then, you know, you ask about what are the provisions of. Uh, uh, not signing, you'll be rejected. What does that mean? Let's talk about it. You know, I'm, I do have some floor. I have a lot of paid vehicles, but I can go floor every vehicle I've got. And if I can just pick the phone up and call GMAC and tell them to come get approximately $4 million worth of inventory, 
at which 90 days or right now they're starting to produce 2010s. Uh, and you've got a business that uh, appears to be going out. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a long leash to 2010, October. And I'd like to make one other uh, comment that uh, just uh, while I do have the uh, floor, one of the provisions of the wind down agreement, one of the provisions of the, of the wind down agreement, uh, I'm paraphrasing this, states that uh, in my case, I'll produce potentially 84 years of sales records. My customers' names, telephone numbers, my service customers' telephone numbers, and I'm given 25 percent of my wind-down money. Uh, I get one person, one attorney come to me and say, and, and, and the purpose of, uh, I'm paraphrasing this, the purpose of these electronic lists of all of my customers are to be used to give them to another third party. Could that be a dealer. replacement dealer? But, uh, that's how I read it. Or my replacement dealer. You know, what I've earned for 84 years, th these are, bulk of these people are my personal friends that I've got to give them their names and telephone numbers. You help me with the federal statute name, the Graham, whatever it is. Yeah, Graham okay. H. Bliley. Uh, no. I'm not an attorney, but I see this as a huge right. liability to a dealer to, to turn done. over their uh, financial uh, uh, customer list. You know, they're confident. You wouldn't go into a doctor's office and ask for somebody's medical records and get it. Yeah. Uh, one customer would uh, more than negate the amount of money that uh, was given. You mean one customer that brought an action? Yeah, brought an action against me. Which required you to respond. And uh, in this world, I can't see how that most likely would not happen. And my, my question to GM was, you know, why do I have to supply uh, my customers' names and said, everything I do is sent to you electronically. Every, every sale that I make, I give you the name, address, you've got them. You know, all of my warranty records, I get the name and address of vehicle number, you know, labor operation number. It's given to them. You know, it's like, again, uh, all of these uh, data processing deals, they're, they're thrown back on us. We pay for those, for, for those uh, mm -hmm. things. And uh, I, I would really like to hear uh, what Mr. Hendrick uh, would say in response to, you know, my fear of turning over uh, my customer's identity. Is that uh, additionally, uh, can he respond to that, yeah. Mr. And, and, and does GM assume the liability? Uh, and then we got to go to Mr. Dingo. GM has a privacy policy. Uh, we have had excellent experience with being able to, to uh, properly control customer and consumer information in our in our corporation's history. Well, it's go it's it, you're, it's said in the agreement it's going to be given to a third party. When it's given to a third party, I don't know how you have control. We, as I said, we've been able to uh, manage customer I, I, information I, I, over time. So who's that third party? Now, now let me ask you this: Would uh, would uh, Jim uh, hold on be in a position uh, to identify move on. me for that for a lawsuit? Okay, we we got to do the questions from here. Sorry, Mr. Dingle, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McElhenney, what is your opinion of GM's and Chrysler's respective dealer closure plans with regard to both substance and procedure? Would you please submit your response? For the record. In the case of Chrysler, in both cases, I think they were too quick and too deep in terms of numbers. I'd like specific criticism, and I'll ask you to submit it for the record because I only have five minutes. In the case uh, and I would ask you also to submit as a part of that uh, how could those be improved to result in fairness, in your view, to the dealers? In the case of both GM and Chrysler, it was not a transparent process. There was, uh, in the case of GM, there was an appeal, which was favorable. None in the case of Chrysler, which I think is problematic. I think with the information we received today uh, that the Chrysler dealers will be provided that criteria, it would seem to make sense that there be an appeal process so those Chrysler dealers that have been canceled can evaluate that. In the case of GM, the wind down uh, is much more favorable, allowing dealers potentially through next October to sell off their parts and inventory and tools and reasonably uh, close their businesses in a rational format. In the case of Chrysler, 
the wind down was, was very abrupt, uh, 26 days. I think it created all kinds of problems for dealers and their employees. So I, I would not uh, think now, what very is highly it going of that. To, what is it going to cost per car for a GM dealer to uh, wind down? And, and how much is he going to lose per car? And how much is a Chrysler dealer going to lose per car? Uh, sir, it would be very hard to project. I, I, based on, I've been a dealer for 36 years. I would guess in the case of GM, there would be uh, some cars, when you get to the tail end of the process, you, you, you have some of the less popular models left. Dealers could lose several thousand dollars in those cases, but it just depends on their own situation. Uh, in the case of Chrysler, uh, those dealers that have vehicles left uh, don't have a franchise, they don't have a license, they can't sell them, they can't get Chrysler incentives. The cost could be, uh, you know, many thousands, five, six, ten thousand dollars per vehicle. All right, now, what charges are in the two uh, closure plans uh, that are detrimental to the dealers, and how could that aspect of it be improved? I I'm sorry, sir, I don't understand the question. I'm not sure I do. <laughs> uh, what is there in the two plans which uh, is particularly hurtful in terms of costs to the dealers, and how could those matters be improved? Okay, sir, in the case of both both GM and Chrysler, when a dealer is losing his franchises, like these gentlemen at the table are and, and so many around the country, they're losing the value of the franchise. It's going to zero. Most dealers... But what I want to know is about this the specific charges per car. In other words, Chrysler's got a $350 item yes. that they have to pay. Uh, are there other charges like that in either one of these plans that would impact upon the dealer? Not that, aware of, that I'm aware of, sir. Other, in no. case of General Motors, they're not buying the cars back, but they're providing the wind-down dealers an opportunity to sell them down over the next 15 right. months. I'm going to submit to you a letter and there will be other letters submitted to others. And I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that, they, that, 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 that those letters and the responses be inserted in the record. Without objection. Um, now, Mr. McElhinney, given your assertion that dealerships do not, in fact, cost money to maintain, why do foreign transplants have significant fewer, significantly fewer dealerships in the United States than their domestic competitors? I happen to be an import dealer as well, a Hyundai and a Toyota dealer, so I, I have some perspective on that. The, the business model for the import, the transplant manufacturers, is quite a bit different than the domestics. GM, Ford, and Chrysler have a very strong market share in the rural markets, much like where I live in Iowa. The, uh, I think Mr. Henderson mentioned earlier they have a 10-point market share advantage in those areas. So it's a competitive advantage for GM, Ford, and Chrysler to have representation in communities, say, less than... 75 or 100,000 people on average where Toyota, Honda, Nissan have no interest. They will not go in and backfill some of these locations that are being closed with, uh, with well, franchises. That's why, their why would they choose not to close, uh, to back those kinds of franchises? That's really at the root of the question. Well, I can't speak words, for them. I would, based on my experience, I would say they don't see the market opportunity for their brands as they do in more uh, metropolitan areas. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Press and Mr. Henderson, Mr. McElhinney has indicated in his testimony that dealer franchises, in fact, do not cost manufacturers money to maintain. Do you agree with this question, or rather with his position or not? I do not. Okay. Mr. Henderson? I do not. Uh, Mr. Press, why? Mr. Henderson, why? Please. Well, in our situation, uh, one of the main reasons that caused our bankruptcy and weak product uh, engineering is the requirement that we provide individual models for each standalone franchise uh, as sister models that cost a substantial amount of money and took resources that had negative returns, no incremental sales, only cost, as one example. That's a huge cost. 
The second one, of course, is the fact of lost sales, lost volume. In a market that's underperforming, those sales don't, don't provide revenue for us. We lose that revenue. In our case, it was about $1.5 billion. The development of individual models is about $1.4 billion. Uh, and so we've, we have, and, and that's a, a very real situation. Third, that because we have so many dealers and our average dealer loses money, we're not having a competitive dealer network that can compete with the other manufacturers in terms of customer satisfaction, location, facilities, trained people, advertising, et cetera. So it's a substantial cost uh, to the company. Mr. Henderson, if you please, would you give me your comments? Yes, Mr. Dingle, in my testimony, I talked about uh, the cost that, have, that the company over, over time has, uh, has incurred to provide support for a dealer body in total, which has been financially weakened. Uh, and so there were the costs that were articulated in the, uh, uh, in the testimony. The second thing I would say is our principal issue, as I said, uh, General Motors market share in rural and small towns in the U.S. is 10 full market share points higher than, uh, than it is on average. It's a source of strength for us. And even when we're done with our restructuring, we'll still have the most extensive dealer body in rural America. What, we ha what costs us today is that we have insufficient distribution in metropolitan markets where we have many, many locations and we have few strong ones. That is a significant problem today. Now, uh, Mr. Press, Mr. Henderson, again, it's been estimated that the average throughput for a foreign transplant dealer is twice that of a comparable domestic dealer. Is this true, yes or no? I don't know exactly the double, but it's substantially higher, perhaps in that range, yes. Okay. It would be our estimate that a Toyota, for example, versus Chevrolet would be approximately double. All right. Now, if this is, if this is true, and apparently it is, why is that the case? Mr. Press first and then Mr. Anderson. The, the reason in Toyota's case is that they sell uh, about 2 million cars and trucks a year out of 1,200 dealers. Uh, and we, we, if we didn't have this restructuring, we would sell uh, about 700,000 cars and trucks a year at retail out of 3,100 dealers. Uh, so it's a, the average sales per dealer is substantially different. In, in Toyota's case, uh, as Mr. McElhinney said, the product line they have is less truck oriented. They sell mainly cars in more metro markets or sunshine states, less presence in smaller rural areas or secondary markets. Uh, and they also don't have an 80-year legacy of having had a substantially higher dealer body and seeing the volume disappear. Mr. Henderson? Uh, sir, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have anything to add to Mr. Press's comments. Now, gentlemen, uh, do you believe that your respective numbers of dealerships has been re reduced per your restructuring plans? And if so, has parity been achieved through these plans in a way which will be adequate? with regard to your foreign transplant competitors? Uh, we, we tried to achieve a dealer network going forward that had the minimal impact on removing dealers. Uh, there have been critics that say that we didn't go far enough, but we didn't want to go all the way to have parity. We think we're in a very good position to continue to go forward business and have that dealer network emerge over time. But through the bankruptcy, and the emergence of a new company, we have the optimum number of dealers going forward, 2391. Thank you. Mr. Henderson? Uh, Mr. Dingle, in our case, uh, as I mentioned also in my testimony, we, have, we would expect that at 3,600 dealers approximately, and a, even with a, only a, a modest improvement in the market next year and conservative market share assumptions, that our dealer volume, throughput would almost double. Uh, very quickly, gentlemen. It has been said that the dealer should be permitted to remain open where you are terminating them to provide service and maintenance. Uh, what is wrong with that arrangement? Well, in, in our situation, of course, because the, there are existing dealers that are surrounding them that are taking, uh, in many cases, 555 cases, the franchise. The, for example, the Dodge Jeep dealer may be taking the Chrysler franchise. They're spending money, they're adding the facility, they're adding overhead. Uh, that's a part of the business in terms of loyal customers and part of the business that would travel with it. Are you telling me this is having an adverse impact on, on adjacent and it, nearby dealers? It, it would have an adverse impact uh, on adjacent dealers. Uh, you know, if there are some uh, cases where that 
there may be a single point that may have a real customer uh, situation where they can't achieve the uh, the location, uh, then we have always had an opportunity to take a look at a, a, a very minimal number of, of uh, points. Uh, but in this particular case, it would it would substantially reduce the the ability of the dealers that go forward uh, to derive the full benefit of their business. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I would have the same response, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Dingle. Um, Mr. Burley, for questions, please. <laughs> Gentlemen, I don't think that's any coincidence that, with the exception of Mr. Walden, the remaining members all come from states that are represented in the Big Ten Conference. Our constituents built your cars and trucks, or in my case, they build tractors and combines and heavy equipment. And the workers who build those products are so brand loyal to your company that they have created a dominant market share for you in the U.S. auto sales that has lasted right up into this moment in history. And Mr. McElhaney and my uncle and my brother-in-law, who are Chevy dealers, advertise your products on Big Ten sports networks so that your products are sold in this area which you have this dominant brand loyalty in. And yet I look at page four, Mr. Henderson, of your proposal, and what do I see? Wind down dealers by state, Pennsylvania 90, Ohio 79, Illinois 66, Wisconsin 50, Michigan 58, Indiana 48, Iowa 46. And after your description of why these foreign automakers are not playing in this part of the country, I find it very difficult to believe that you will perpetuate your brand loyalty in light of these massive dealer closures in my state, in Representative Stupak and Congressman Dingell's state, in Congresswoman Sutton's state. I see the evaporation of your market share because of this practice. And I just wonder where, whether as part of your restructuring you have given consideration to that. Mr. Henderson? Sir, first of all, I'm a Wolverine, born in the state of Michigan. Uh, second of all, when we're done, uh, General Motors will still have what we believe will be the largest distribution system for rural and small towns in the U.S. Approximately 1,500 of our 3,600 dealers will be located in those small towns, and we do believe we'll be able to maintain a strong position. Sir. Actually, th through the, uh, the new dealer network, we've increased the share of dealers that are in rural markets. Uh, and reduce the share of dealers in, in uh, metro markets. We do realize the importance. Uh, the difficulty is uh, from our volume going from a peak of 2 million to 700,000, we don't produce enough vehicles to have every dealer stay in business. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but it's a fact, and we're trying to make sure that the dealers have a high enough volume that they can stay in business and have a good operation going forward to compete with the transplants. Well, with all due respect to the two of you who have accomplished much in your careers, I would submit that the, the people sitting on this side of the table have a much deeper sense for the attitude of our constituents, and I would be shocked to see your brand loyalty maintained in light of these shutdowns. Now, one of the things we know, Mr. Walden referenced this in his opening statement, is uh, companies, both companies have been doing advertising to talk about their business strategy going forward. And Mr. Henderson, we've seen the GM ads that talk about how your company is going to stand behind the products it sells going forward. But re in reality, you're not standing behind your products because one of the things we know is as part of these bankruptcy proceedings, every existing and future product liability claim that your company could be responsible for for selling a defective product is going to be extinguished. Isn't that true? In our case, uh, warranty, recall will all be assumed by the new company, but in the case of product liability, purchasers in the normal 363 process do not assume that sort of obligation. That's and true. so they will be extinguished in the bankruptcy? They would be unsecured claimants of the old General Motors. And they will be extinguished because we all know what happens to those unsecured claimants? Likely. Yes. Now, have you informed your dealer network that you're going to be passing on a massive cost shifting to them because of that? Uh, no, we're not going to be passing. Yes, you are, sir, because I can tell you in the state of Iowa, Mr. McElhaney is currently immune from liability as a distributor of your product, 
if the manufacturer is in existence and is not in bankruptcy. That is uh, the fact in almost every state under state product liability law. So if you disappear as a potential claimant in that process, every one of these dealers is going to be on the hook, not just your remaining dealer network, but existing dealers that no longer have a franchise. In our case, uh, the both wind down, wind down agreements as well as the continuation agreements will be assumed by the new General Motors and the indemnification provisions that GM has today will continue. The indemnification procedures, the so you are going to assume responsibility and pass that liability on? Through, as part of our obligation, we will continue to indemnify the dealers who sign a new agreement with New General Motors. And so they're going to have to rely upon you to step up after they've been sued and they pass that on to you and then they're going to have to have counsel involved because of that status. Um. Uh, sir, I, I think that by virtue of the, the indemnification continuing to the new company, uh, we, in, we did that purposely to, to, to try to avoid the situation where the dealer could be uh, badly, badly hurt. Now, Mr. McElhaney, I want to give you the last opportunity to talk about the impact on every one of the dealers that you represent as chairman of NADA who haven't had a seat at the table and haven't had an opportunity to tell their story because I'm guessing you've been getting a lot of phone calls. What, what's it been like for you and what type of concerns are you hearing? Well, we're hearing uh, many of the concerns that have been expressed earlier today by some of the dealers on this panel. They're, they run the gamut. There are dealers that have uh, most of their sometimes third, fourth generation. My family, as you know, has been in business for 95 years. Fortunately, we uh, are going forward, but there are a lot of dealers like me that are not. Most dealers, their net worth of their enterprise, their life savings is represented in the, the value of their real estate, if they in fact own it, and the value of their franchise. In, in the case of dealers being terminated by either GM or Chrysler, the franchise value is zero uh, immediately. And the real estate value with single purpose real estate, uh, particularly in this commercial real estate market that is pretty stressed anyway, would be severely devalued even to the point where many cases dealers will, will owe more money on the property than it's worth or they may have a lease that they're obligated to for a number of years and, and, and have no way to uh, generate revenue to pay for that lease. So those are some of the issues. There are dealers that have made significant investments in facilities with the expectation that they would have a franchise going forward as long as they met the requirements of the, of the uh, franchise agreement that are, uh, are being left with those obligations. So the, there's just a myriad of stories that are uh, that are very tough uh, personal bankruptcies in many cases dealers and their employees having to take personal bankruptcy and the dealership employees we haven't talked a lot about they are uh, they earn on average about twice what is paid in, in retail uh, so these are good jobs most of these people will not be able to go to other dealerships and find employment particularly in this market in a 10 million market I don't know of any dealers that are hiring people I, I suspect there may be some as this uh, rationalization takes place and dealers have bigger market areas. But for the most part, those uh, 120, 130,000 employees of terminated dealerships will have to find work probably outside the auto sector. And, uh, and it's a tough market, as you well know, to, uh, to find employment right now. So there's some pretty devastating stories out there. Thank you, Mr. Burley. Ms. Sutton for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to, uh, I was talking to Mr. Press about the appeal process and I talked about the state law and under state laws across this country. Um, it's, it's my understanding that you can terminate for just cause, you can terminate dealerships. Is that your understanding, Mr. Henderson? Mr. Press wasn't certain. Um, I have the same recollection. I think uh, there are provisions, uh, but they do depend by, uh, by state, but yes, in general, for cause. Right. When you say they depend, there may be differences, but they all have some sort of just cause standard. Is that correct? Uh, I can't answer the question, ma'am. Okay. Well, I can tell you in Ohio there's a, a law that allows for termination based on just cause, so we can just go with, with, with that understanding. Um, let, let me ask you, how many dealerships did GM close last year based on just cause under state laws? I will have to get back to you with an answer. I don't know the answer to that. Do you have any idea? Any idea? No. Okay. And how many are you um, slated to close through this bankruptcy? Uh, as we talked about, uh, we will move from approximately 6,000 dealerships to approximately 3,600 over time. Okay. 
2,600, is that about right? 3,600. 3, no, no. Uh, about 2,400. 2,400, okay. I had 26, so thank you. I want to follow up on a, a reason, little. by the way, was because that, that number isn't perfect. It can go anywhere, so it can go anywhere from 3,400 to 3,800. Okay, good enough. Um, I want to follow up on some of the discussion that was going on a, a while back about um, uh, information being transferred from the dealerships that are, are, are being closed. And um, the discussion of, uh, uh, you said that you, GM has a record of, uh, you know, securing that data in a way that is appropriate. And uh, it was mentioned that it's going to go, obviously, to third parties. So who are those third parties exactly? Do we, are they all identifiable at this point? We can identify them for you. These would be parties that we would typically use to uh, sell vehicles to customers to make sure that their service is taken care of, to provide uh, uh, surveys. Uh, these are, there's many reasons why we would want to contact customers. Right. I would appreciate you submitting um, all of the third parties that might receive that information to the committee. Mr. Spitzer, I want to thank you again for uh, coming to testify today, and I want to just ask you a little bit more. You, you spoke earlier about some of the investment that you've, uh, you've put into, uh, into this life's work of yours, uh, yeah. representing uh, Chrysler and, and, and their products. Um, how much have you invested in Project Genesis so far? Working closely with the uh, per people from the management of the business center, which is the Great Lakes Business Center, includes Michigan, Illinois, and mm -hmm. so forth, that that is, has responsibility for um, our most of our dealerships except one. Working very much in concert with them, and sometimes almost at their direction. I won't say insistence, but let's say strongly urging. Um, we have consolidated two uh, Genesis stores. Uh, one of them uh, is in Florida, with a different business center. was the first one in the state, I think, or very close, four or five years. It actually was called Project Alpha at that time. We've, we have spent, in concert with, um, again, with Chrysler Corporation, I think about $6 million in acquisitions of, at their urging insistence. In fact, in two or, th two or three cases, I was called by Chrysler, said, this is the guy you got to buy, and here's... Here's what you do, call them, buy it out, and that way we'll consolidate. That's in just goodwill, blue sky that has gone, it's gone away. And over and above that, we have invested in Project Alpha, or excuse me, Project Genesis now. They changed the name somewhere along the line. Didn't change anything else but the name, I don't think. Uh, I think in bricks and mortar, about just about $10 million. That doesn't count the land. That's just in buildings done in concert with Chrysler to consolidate and accomplish Project De Genesis. And with all due respect to Mr. Press, who I've had a healthy respect for over the years, going back to his days with Toyota, we've known Mr. Press for probably 30 years. And um, the, the uh, arbitrary way in which these dealers were selected has no connection to Project Genesis or all three brands or standalone. From my own experience, I can sure, assure you of that, and also anecdotal observations from other dealers that I know that where standalones went forward, where Genesis got canceled, and, and all the permutations and combinations that are out there. Have you uh, received the written criteria that, uh, explaining why your dealerships have been canceled? We received nothing. Nothing. Fact, we didn't even day. receive termination. It was on the web. I was told about it by other people that saw it on the web. We, we didn't even get notification of who was going forward um, directly. I see. And I want to just give Mr. Kaikenap a chance to, uh, to speak up about, uh, if you could ask a question um, here today, uh, what would that question be? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, if, you don't, if you don't recall. I, I, I think what's 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 frustrating is that we're a very good dealership and and we've done a good job and there's other dealerships that surround us that have lost financing that don't have the ability to buy cars we owned all our cars outright we didn't have a financing problem and now there's there's dealerships within GM and Chrysler that don't have the ability to finance their vehicles 
they're now having to get bailed out by the Small Business Administration, and it's frustrating. I think there's probably some things that I might have said um, that created frustration with the factory, and I think it cost us mm -hmm. employees jobs. But I think we've done a we've done a great job, and I know that um, within within Tacoma they they want to they want a point, and and we're applying for that point, and um, I, I just hope that you know that they take a look at us because I I, I think we are the dealer, and and if if we were to have conversations with them in, in regards to maybe moving maybe moving the point to someone else, we'll do whatever it takes. Um, I believe in the product. I, be, I believe in, in what they're doing is, is, is right. I don't believe in eliminating the dealer body did any good. I believe the bankruptcy was something that was in inevitable. But the products that they make are far superior. The Dodge Charger, the Challenger, the new 1500 are phenomenal. And I believe in the product. And it's just, it's just unfortunate that when we have such a well-run business and there's other, there's other dealers that are out there that are, that are substandard, you can really look at any metrics from any dealership and shoot holes in every one of them. And I, I don't believe it was, uh, Fair. I, uh, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, just just going to follow up, clean this up, the searing up a little bit, then we'll uh, we'll adjourn. A uh, couple questions, if Mr. Henderson, if the government's going to own 68 percent of the new General Motors, uh, or, and, and even Mr. Press, I guess I'm, I'm concerned, as I said, my opening areas about uh, about the rural areas, especially where I live. Some of you have talked about 100,000, 80,000. I don't have a county in my district that has 70,000. I mean, I'm, I'm vast rural area. And I think we got like six Chrysler uh, dealerships being closed, uh, maybe about four or five, maybe more than that, uh, in my district of General Motors. Uh, how are people going to get service? I mean, if I bought a car this year, a General Motors or a Chrysler, and my dealer's closed, how, how do I get service on that car? Am I going to have to go somewhere else, in other words, drive two hours when my service light comes on? Yeah, take your F-15, <laughs> but uh, I mean, how do you do it? And, and especially when you talk about the loyalty is in the rural areas. You got 10 percent greater loyalty base in the rural areas, but boy, we're getting hard hit here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your concern, especially for the customers, and that's a very fair question. Customer uh, satisfaction is very important. Uh, in our particular case, after the reorganization, we've actually increased the share of our dealer body that's in rural markets. Uh, the, the, a higher portion of metro market dealers were actually removed. But, but I, guess, I guess I'm saying if you improved the rural market, why would you close in my district? You can't get much more rural than me. Well, it, what we did is... I mean, we lost six of them. Uh, the, the largest impact was on metro markets where the dealers were too close to each other. In, in I don't have any metro markets. I know that. 600 well, miles from one in my district to the next. Uh, I, I, and I realize that. And very few people in between. I'm very familiar with your, your area. I, I go there on weekends often, so I appreciate that. Uh, actually, in terms of customer convenience, but from the old dealer group to the new dealer group, the actual distance from a customer to a dealership increased 0.94 miles. Uh, so we, we were very careful to make sure that we were able to retain the convenience to customers. Th there may be some that's going to be nationwide. Well, that's, a, that's for hey. all rural markets. There, there may be. How can it be in for, for nine point nine, nine like one mile more for rural markets? For rural markets, there there will be a few rural markets that will no longer be represented in. The only way to do that is then you're going to have to take these dealerships you've shut down and move other dealers in their places. Well, there's other dealers that have access to these markets or are adjacent, uh, especially in a case, for example. Uh, where there's a Dodge dealership uh, that goes out, the Dodge franchise will go to the Chrysler Jeep dealership that's in the same place. So the, the distance from uh, repairs may, may not increase or be very minimal uh, in terms of the number of locations. 
And, and then I think second, it's uh, from a standpoint of, of those markets, if there's a market, there may be some markets where we are abandoning the market. If there's no longer a potential for long-term growth, then we don't have, with 700,000 units of production, we just don't have enough vehicles to right, give but, to them. But, but, I, but I trusted you guys. I bought a car this year, okay, when the big push was on. And, and you abandon those markets, you abandon me. And if I remember correctly, the federal government says we're going to guarantee these warranties for five years. So I, the federal government, I'm going to go guarantee these cars, for warranties for five years when you abandon part of my area? Well, we, I might need that F-15. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any F-15 uh, trips that are necessary for service because we did look at the average distance. But um, we will sure take a look at, at your area and see what the distance difference would be because uh, a Jeep dealership, uh, that closed that the repairs of that Jeep dealership can now be made in the Dodge Chrysler dealership that exists within the same market area. So the customers will have another uh, service outlet available. Mr. Henderson, you want to? Uh, certainly, we we tried uh, as much as possible to uh, manage the the drive times for service. We looked at state by state. Uh, we looked at averages. We looked at averages across the United States. If I look, for example, in the Upper Peninsula, average of Michigan, 19 to 23 minutes in Oregon, for Chevrolet, we'll go from, this is in miles, excuse me, from 10 to 14 and a half miles. The whoa, issue whoa. we have, excuse me, the issue is we have is on the extremes, because there will be situations where we clearly have a problem. Well, let, Mr. Chairman, if I might, go ahead. you're closing the Klamath Falls dealership. Mm -hmm. It's probably at least 100 miles to Medford. That's the nearest Chevy, any kind of Chevrolet. So those people in southern Oregon are going to go from Klamath Falls now to Medford. I suppose they go to Lakeview. Burns, you're closing Burns. It's 136 miles to Payette, Idaho, is the nearest dealership, right? That's what I said. We do have, we will have situations where we have problems, and we're going to have to solve these problems. And how will you solve those problems well, by it, putting a dealership back in? This is actually not our intent. That's not what we want to do. And one of the things we've said. How do you? How do you? Solve in the case it? of, well, first of all. Other General Motors franchises can provide service work. We don't generally. There isn't another one in understand. Klamath Falls, Burns. So the the second thing we said is, in the event we need to put a place, uh, put a location back, right. one of the things that we committed to the Senate, and I'll commit to you today, is that if we need to relocate a spot there, we will provide the existing operator the opportunity to actually look at that first. Okay, so let's go to Bend, Oregon. You've closed Bend, you've closed Redmond, and you leave Madras. So what's that process that's going to be put in place that allows Mr. Thomas maybe to go get his dealership back? You're telling me you're going to look at it and you're going to decide. How to, I wouldn't be asking you these questions if it weren't taxpayer dollars sure. funding this whole thing. I mean, I'd let you all figure it out under the laws of the land. It's not that. And these are the questions that are coming at us we, we can't answer. And I actually voted for TARP. I didn't vote for the auto bailout. I admit it. But I, didn't, I, I voted for TARP. What we will do, as I said, is we have location by location. If we've made mistakes in the, in the in the future and we've concluded we cannot take care of customers in the location and a point needs to be put back, we would go to whoever the individual who was affected and, and give them the first chance to do that. All right. What, we may follow that up further because I'm just looking at Chrysler here and here's Michigan, even though you get the Upper Peninsula very small. Uh, Marquette and Escanaba, my two biggest cities, dealers are gone. That's my two biggest cities in the, Esca in the Upper Peninsula. They're gone. And then now next one closest across the bridge is Sheboygan. That's gone. Next one is Petoskey. That's gone. Next one is Rogers City. That's gone. And, and actually, with the Cadillac dealer, there's no one in northern Michigan. Basically, north of Lansing, well, Traverse City, I'll take that back, which is no longer part of my district. I mean, there, there isn't a Cadillac dealer around there uh, with some of these ideas. Not that I drive Cadillacs, I told you, I'm an Oldsmobile guy, and it took that away from me, too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hurting now. But I, I don't want our, the point is, the distances we have to travel, I'm going to have to follow that up, because I, I just, just looking at the map and the things that have been closed, it just doesn't make sense. As I, I know those district and those miles in between very, very well. So that's where when members say it could probably hurt you, especially in the rural areas where you have your most lower, loyal customer base. I agree, plus the federal government said we're going to guarantee these warranties. I don't know how we're going to service them. Any other member? Mr. Braley, Ms. Sutton, Mr. Walton? I just want to add one thing, Mr. Chairman, and I think that because of the concerns that we have uh, raised today about 
one of the other critical aspects of these bankruptcies, that is the responsibility going forward for any products that may be defective and the implications for U.S. taxpayers and the dealers in this room. I would strongly urge the committee to take up that issue as well and, and flesh it out in more detail. I think it has enormous economic consequences even for people who have lost their franchise, and I would like to explore that in further detail. Mr. Walden. Well, and I, I think that this flooring issue with GMAC, I, I continue to hear from dealers about flooring in and of itself. Also, just to reiterate, uh, I know Dr. Burgess had to leave, but uh, I know he entered into that discussion with both you, Mr. Press, and, and Mr. Henderson about email traffic to the uh, uh, Mr. I think it's D's and the White House and all that. And I, I understood you both to indicate you would supply that. Uh, email. We'll follow up. I think Dr. Burgess, the appropriate process would be for him to follow up with a letter of request. Um, but I sense that's not a problem for you all to, to provide those emails. Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to add, of, of course, um, and as you can see who stayed here at, at the end of this hearing, uh, as it was pointed out, the, the CARS Act that we passed this week, you know, Representative Braley, he was a, an original co-sponsor, and Chairman Stupak and Chairman Dingell. Um, were involved in, in, in the process of getting that bill done, and it's in, intended to have a concrete impact because we really do believe, as Mr. Kaiken said, uh, you know, we, we want Chrysler and GM to be a success because we know how linked it is to our communities and we know how linked it is to jobs and the food that it puts on the, the tables of the people that we're so uh, you know, honored to represent. And so it's painful for us to, 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 to be here and in this position, but I, 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 the pain that, that we feel listening to this is nothing compared to what we've heard displayed here of the, the, the folks who are losing their dealerships. And I want to thank all of you who came here today to put a human face and perspective about costs of, of what is going on on this major problem. So thank you all for coming. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. We do want you to be successful. Well, well, thanks, and uh, that concludes all the questions from members. Um, I think the hearings have been helpful. Um, you know, since the Senate hearing, we now have a appeal process with General Motors to help out some of these dealers. There's GM and the Auto Dealers Association have been working together trying to do some things. I think that's pos positive. I think we have further explanations. But we'll continue to monitor this. There is that H.R. 2743 sitting out there, GMAC and others. Um, and, and it's been a long hearing. We appreciate everybody for coming. And, and if there's something anyone wants to add, I'll give you all a minute if, if you want to add something or so. Um, I we really, really do appreciate, especially dealers and Mr. Henderson, Mr. Press, and others coming some distance. And I know during this hearing, once you've raised your hand in that, uh, but because the rules of the hearing, I couldn't recognize you at times. So if there's something you want to add, Mr. Golick, I know you did. Go ahead, and we'll go right down the line, Mr. Spitzer. If anyone wants to add something, we will. Then we'll wrap this up. We're going to keep it somewhat brief. I'm just perplexed. Uh, when Mr. Press last week said that in the case of the dealers not being taken forward last year, they lost 55,000 units of sales. I, I um, that, that number is real important to them, apparently. <clears throat> um, but then, like I say, they're going to lose 140,000 units in sales when, when the, these dealers are removed. I know that he says they can only produce 700,000 cars, but there has to be a plan in place for growth. If the market improves, I'm sure he can build another 100, 140,000 cars. I, that's why, that's, I'm perplexed over that. So just thought I'd throw that in. Thank you, and thank you again for coming. Mr. Spitzer, you, anything? Just a song. Mr. Key can have anything. Mr. Press. I really appreciate the opportunity to communicate with the, with the committee and uh, provide this information. It's been a very good learning experience for us. This will be good communications going forward. I don't know if I'm looking forward to our performance review when I come back, but I guess this will be the forum to do that. Thank you.
Mr. Henderson. Um, uh, like Mr. Press, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee for your time. Thank, uh, thank uh, the dealers for joining us here. Uh, very, very much appreciate it. Uh, um, because this is a very difficult time for all of us, and I very much appreciate the professionalism. So thank you very much. Mr. McElney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of uh, 19,000 new car dealers in the country. I guess I would just say, in this difficult environment, that we know how tough the economy is, particularly the auto sector, if a dealer is able to keep his doors open, make the payroll, keep his customers coming in, floor plan his inventory, is probably a pretty good operator. I know there are other elements that play into that, but uh, I think that's important to remember as we look at this. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paddock. No, other than just saying thank you for giving me the opportunity today. Thank you. Mr. Blankenbeckler. Thanks for letting me come. Uh, I think I have a story, and I think everybody here uh, is here today has a story. It's. Uh, not a happy time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, <clears throat> I would close with a rhetorical question, and that will be, with all these closings, will other makers uh, go to these institutions that have facilities available and bring their new products and convey them to the public instead of the established makers? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank you very much. That concludes our questioning, concludes our hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for your testimony. The committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. I ask unanimous consent that the contents of our document binder, with the exception of tabs 1 and 3, be entered into the record, provided the committee staff may redact any information that is business proprietary, relates to privacy concerns, or is law enforcement sensitive. Without objection. Without objection, documents will be entered into the record. That concludes our hearing. Meeting of this subcommittee is adjourned. We'll show the entire hearing again on the impact of the GM and Chrysler bankruptcies on auto dealers tonight at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN.